Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Nathan. How are you? Good deal. Good. Hey, we were talking earlier about a little story you had when you uh, found a rock out there and was doing some strange stuff. You want to start from the beginning and just let everybody know? Yeah, so a um, little background on myself anyway, and to put some context to it. You, you know, i just a uh, avid, curious person my entire life, always, um, you know, researching and dabbling in things and um, spend a lot of time outdoors. And, you know, one of my mantras every time I was doing something outdoors was, you know, bring something home from nature, do something with. So um, I was uh, upstate New York, um, right along the Hudson River, just north of uh, Troy, um, New York in the Alban, upper Albany area. And um, I had found a bunch of interesting mineral specimens uh, in that area that I thought were nice and that I could do something with and um, brought them home with me and um, started working on them, uh, you know, with the intent to make some jewelry. And, it, you know, in doing so, I uh, found that it actually, um, the minerals that I was um working on just were acting weird that was the best way that i could put it at the time you know and uh the more that i worked on them the more fascinating and curious it became to me because of some of the unusual things that um these uh, mineral specimens were kind of exhibiting um yeah which led me down kind of a research rabbit hole and also you know just kind of playing around and experimenting with the rocks a little bit um you know, to get a better idea of what I was dealing with. So um, really the weirdness of the mineral specimens um, started when I, I had started uh, drilling out uh, cores, you know, to see if I could cut them into like little cabochons um, with, a, with a hollow diamond bit. Um, so I had drilled a bunch of plugs out of this um, one mineral specimen that was very interesting. It was um, crystal white um you know a clear white crystal um with um really really deep dark green and black um with kind of um bright green stripes down it um you know so i it was just such a fascinating looking stone i start cutting it and it, it, as i realize um i'm putting pressure on this thing and i get the plug out this plug um, started acting very unusually. It like didn't really want to stay in my hand. You know, I would just be holding it, sanding it, and all of a sudden, for no good reason, I have total grip on the thing. No matter how hard I was holding on to this thing, it would find itself out of my hand. You know, and on a couple of occasions, it found itself out of my hand and across my room. You know, which was. Wow fucking mind-blowing part of my friend yeah you know right. it was it was uh mind-blowing um and i just thought it was the weirdest thing i really couldn't ex get a good explanation you know to myself of it at, at the time um you know and then i started like i said fiddling around with it and i would take some of these mineral samples or run it over another piece of the mineral and sometimes it would do nothing and then other times it would lock onto it like like a you know like a magnet would let's just say you know but then if you if you poked at it a little bit all of a sudden it was like the poles would change and it would go boop and flip around sometimes it would flip upside down you know other times it would just turn itself um and a lot of it some of it was very extreme and very obvious and and also and sometimes if you if you ran a piece of the mineral atop of another piece of it, um, it would become impossible to move. You know, very similar to like if like two flat neodymium magnets are snapped together, how if you just try to like pork them against each other like that, how, it, it, you know, that force is just very great. It was very similar to that, except sometimes it was just snapped to my table surface. Yeah. You know, um, other times, like it would feel very light, and other times it would feel very heavy. You know, it and and it didn't seem to have rhyme or reason. Um, you know, it was seemingly influenced by, um, you know, being touched. 
um, certainly affected by being impacted, definitely affected by other sources of magnetism. Um, you know, and when I would, um, it, it also had bodily effects, by the way. So like if I was like holding a piece of it, um, you know, there was, I'm very sensitive to energies and things like that, like magnetic fields. If there's a fairly strong magnetic field, uh, you know, something catches my attention, you know, and uh, it, it's like a sense thing, I guess. Um, but, you know, like this felt like it was very static, like it, like it had a static charge. Um, you know, it would lock up my hand, you know, or cause my hand to spasm. Um, even if I wasn't in contact with it, you know, um, I, you know, it would pass that charge on to me. I would then become charged, I, I would suppose. And then it would have residual effect. Um, and then it uh, had a situation where it was just on my desk and like the um, immediate vicinity of my Amazon Alexa. And just randomly it would, you know, no longer have a signal at all. It was still on and functioning, but it just uh, didn't know what time it was. It didn't know where it was. It thought I was in like other countries <laughs> at one point in time. Um, then other times it just wouldn't work at all. You would ask it a question and it would just like load, you know, and then just say, sorry, can't help you. Um, you know, and, and it seemed to affect uh, that signal. Um, you know, and, and the operation of that device uh, just by being in the immediate vicinity. And even when I had removed the specimen from, um, you know, that vicinity, it took uh, several days for that Alexa to all of a sudden decide that it was alive again, um, despite trying to reset it, unplug it, let it, whatever, you know, like it just, it, it held whatever effect um, for that significant amount of time. Um, I no longer have the mineral sample, which is super disappointing. I have fragments of it. Um, the fragments still display some characteristic, um, but I think that uh, the larger pieces, definitely with the larger lattice structure of whatever this was, exhibited um, the effects that I noticed um, much greater. Uh, one thing that I didn't even tell you, Nathan, that there were two things um, one was, uh, like I said, on the physical effects, it put a metallic taste in my mouth anytime I was around it. Like, uh, even with the small samples that I have, which are super minuscule, super minuscule, I still get a metallic saliva ridden situation in my mouth um, anytime I'm around it. Um, you know, also, uh, when I was in contact with the larger pieces frequently, there were bouts that I had for a couple of days following it where like, I would just feel very, very heavy, very, very heavy, like out of nowhere. And, you know, caused my girlfriend to think I was losing my mind. And I explained to her that I wasn't, I explained to her the science that I had researched behind it, you know, between, you know, uh, you know, the static charge of it and um, the piezoelectric effects of it and how I'm actively screwing with it to cause it to act up, you know, because um, when it's in a rest state, it's just sitting there, it's not doing anything. And every so often, I suppose it would kind of shift itself based on its environment, I guess, influences. But if you left it alone, it didn't really do anything. If you started screwing with it, you'd have a metal taste in your mouth, you know, even if it was at a distance. So it was that um, aggravation of it that, uh, you know, that was causing it. Uh, the best that I'm able to um, determine uh, was that it, it was a derivative of um, a Hubert Smithite um, crystal mineral. Um, Hubert Smithite is working off of my memory here. It's a zinc copper um, hydroxide cl hydroxide chlor uh, chloride. That's that's exactly what it is. So now that I'm thinking about it, yeah. Zinc copper hydroxide chloride. And um, it, it's often also found with um, 
magnesium element as well, depending on, um, you know, what it is, where it came from, et cetera. How it got to where I found it, no good idea. Mountains are a weird thing like that. Hmm. Glaciers are a weird thing like that, you know. Uh, but um, apparently, uh, you know, the crystalline structure that it holds is, um, you know, four, four dimensionally. Um, like the, the macabre, uh, you know, that, that you were describing, it's in fact the same exact thing. Um, and, uh, what's significant about it is they, they consider it. And again, the scientific word salads that they come up with quantum spin liquid, um, you know, basically saying that the electrons that, uh, are being held in this, um, you know, they're, they're not fixed in time or space. So, you know, they, they could have moments of excitement um you know and those moments of excitement would directly be correlated with um you know the arrangement of the the electron spin depending on um you know whatever influences there are uh they were able to uh, synthesize this in a laboratory and do some study on it and um the difficulty that i've had is they'll talk about the effect they'll talk about the material that they made they won't talk about application or what they're discovering in it which perplexes me because some of these seminars are hours and hours and hours long with they're hiding it from you real deal you know physicists funded you know teaching at high level academic institutes and you know they're they're beating around the bush as to like what they're actually doing with the substance all they're doing is describing the substance so it, yeah. it, it, it's kind of hard because uh, we deal with charge magnetics different things frequencies what was the structure like inside the rock how would you describe that um well when i cut into it it was um very fascinating um i could send you photos uh at another time i have them on an old phone but uh it it was sort of like molten if you but it was crystalline but the coloration of it was molten um like it had flows okay so more like a kind of like a lava rock when you open it up and you find your crystalline structure on the inside where it's cavernous on the outside is that it was cavernous on the outside um it had uh druzy quartz deposits on the outside very micro but fully developed quartz crystals crusting a certain part of it, which was actually what caught my eye to pick it up. You know, um, what kind of caught my eye after that is the fact that it was had bands of green running all through it, um, you know, that were also crystals and then also just compressed bands. Um, there were parts of it that were porous and cavernous for certain. Um, and then there were other portions of it that um really didn't have any void inclusions or fractures or anything like that that green part was pretty solid you know um i assume that uh it was uh, you know probably um it was it was like uh, quartz crusted um like some type of uh, you know limestone or calcium uh mineral that was its original matrix um with the with the green cluster like you know um basically sandwiched but um the best way uh, that i could describe it is like um there's scarns in the earth you know where the crusts meet and these scarns they twist like this yeah. and that's what kind of gave it that flow is that pressure that heat and that you know twisting and i think that's what gave it like a flow appearance well was it anything like basalt um no not really um basalt you know has like those little micro pox all over it you know and they s seemingly kind of ordered and whatever like this was just straight crystalline um yeah and, and it's not it, it doesn't it's not an igneous formation uh, like a basalt is, you know, this is a 
a secondary formation. Um, it, it could only really be, you know, um, formed in in high highly soluble superheated liquids. You know, for that structure to occur. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, I, I was looking at it. When we were talking earlier. Uh, when you get heavy charge on something, okay, it's just short of a magnetic field. So it's like high voltage, very low heat. When you touch something like that, you're adding heat to the system. So you're going to add an amp to it. So it's very little. It's very short. But what it does is something extraordinary. It'll start putting out a field from it. And it's like a static field. That's what interrupts your Alexa. Okay. Yeah, that's what was going on there. You're putting out the <laughs> static field without realizing it by adding just a little bit of heat because it's generally cold. I bet you that rock, rock was ice cold when you touched it. Um, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it was, but you know, you fiddle with it enough and it would, it would warm up. And I'm not talking like fr heavy friction either. You know, I'm talking poking it around. And it would have a temperature change. Also, as I mentioned, um, there were moments of the, its excitement where its um, color would fluctuate in its intensity. Um, there were there were times where it was so dark green that it was black to the eye for intents and purposes. You know, even if you're shining the light at it, you could tell it's green, but it looks black. You would get this thing going, and it would look slime green. You know. Well, more like on the emerald side of things, but that brightness, that intensity, you know, which was pretty cool. Um, I do uh, have a little, little tiny piece of it left. Like I said, um, you know, it, explaining this to, I, I broke, I broke Hermes' rule of, you know, the lips are sealed, but <laughs> the ears of understanding, you know, and um, tried to explain some of this to like my girlfriend, and she wasn't having it, you know, so. She thought I was losing my fucking marbles, and you know, I ended up getting rid of the specimen to save face on all this, you know, just because whatever. But I did have a couple of little tiny pieces, and I could feel it in my hand as soon as I pick it up. Jesus, but I mean, I don't know if you could get focus on that. Hold on, let me go. Let me change the screen real quick. But see how it's white on the one side crystal, and then the other side is green. Like yeah, that. It's a little blurry. Pull it back just a little bit. Sure. Okay. I can see the white on it. Yeah. I can, can feel, feel this thing in my, in my hand right now. You can feel the energy coming out of it. Yeah, in these fingers right here. Yeah. And um, I actually took some scraps that I had of it and I um, combined it in a highly soluble um, uh, Rochelle salt magnesium solution. And crystallized it. And this piece is full. Oh, you can't stay in my hand. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. Um, and I could feel this one too. This is a lot bigger, but you know, it's um you can see it's not green or anything, it's just got really, really fine particles of this stuff in it, you know. And I'll see if I can get it to be excited here. Uh, it's right there. I just touched it and it and now it doesn't stay on it. Now it's stuck to my phone stand that's aluminum. <laughs> so I know it's this is a very unprofessional way to go about this, but Oh, just keep going, man. We're all good. Now it's funny because ever since I brought this on, I've already seen the color shift in it. You can see how green it is now maybe as compared to before and the part that was whitish is clear <laughs> so you know and that's not a lighting trick it's in the same exact spot so yeah it's um you know i'll have to capture uh i haven't pulled this out in quite a while you know so i'll have to capture some video footage if i can get it to do something interesting um yeah, but I could feel it, so I'm going to put it down now. It's like my hand is kind of, like this middle finger is it, at the tensor. It's kind of like pulling back on. Here's another, here's another good piece. 
Not a lot of people don't know this. If you don't play with high voltage a lot, I do. I know exactly oh, what shit. you're doing. Oh, hold on. Let me bring it up and slowly out. Hold on. Hey, you disappeared. They might click back on if you're there. He just kind of disappeared from everything, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we need a better image, that's for sure. It was blurring out when you get close to the camera. Absolutely. This is really cool, man. Hold on. He probably just hit something. So let me just uh, – there we go. I just sent him a message. Here he is. Uh, yeah. All right. There you are. Yeah. This is, I'm telling you. Well, hold on. Hold on. Let me bring you back to solo layout. Hey, it's getting blurry as you bring it towards it. So, okay, can... I'll keep it back. There we go. We can start to see that right, right in that area. So, I see the green, I see the white. I can see if they got a little bit of clear on it. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty much the deal with it. It's right throughout that whole thing. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, so well, we'll try to get some footage of it and stuff. Um, you know, I I, I don't know, um, you know, what use this really could be. I try to consider a couple of different uses for it. Um, but seeing as it fluctuates as it does, you know, if um if the fluctuations could be controlled, I think that that's um, a, a powerful um, material element at that point that could, you know, really bring benefit into the overall, you know, goals here. Yeah, well, I don't want to say this. I, I want to say it without saying anything medical. Your your blood has, you know what I mean, materials in it, like iron and stuff like that, right? And if you're getting something in your fingers, it's because of that interaction with the metal and the magnetism that's going on. I get it when I play with high voltage a lot. Very low amps, very high volts. I get it in my fingers. I always feel like I have fumble fingers. Probably yep. like you feel when you're playing with that thing, right? Mm -hmm. It always feels like something's rejecting your hands. I just think of it, you know, hey, I got some big hands. You know, the problem, it just falls out. It might be a little bit more. So I just found it interesting that you would say that metallic taste all the time, mm -hmm. all the time. It, as soon as the static hits the air, I start to taste it. Yeah. And I could sense it. So it, like I've, I'm very attuned to it. I could like sense it as soon as I like start fumbling around with it. I'm like, up oh, there it is, you know, and, uh, you know, and then the energy stuff too. Like I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you like, psychologically you know um having high amounts of that crap around wasn't the best for me you know like mm. it would you know it it um you know again i'm pretty sensitive to vibrations tones all those sorts of stuff like there's certain things that'll you know always kind of grab me and i'm like oh yeah all right that you know and uh this kind of did that and it was very very intense and it wasn't bad you know but whatever frequency or you know resonance it has itself you know paired with the static charge that it's kind of emanating and whatnot like it was so intense that like it, 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 it there was a point in time where i put it outside i didn't want to be around I, I was like this has to be outside by, by the way, what you're describing is the same thing people describe when they talk about the crystal skull. <laughs> yeah. Have, you, have cool. you ever heard the story? It's it's about the same. I'd heard the story, except I'd never heard that part of it. I mean, I know the story of the crystal skulls, you know, when they found it in Mexico. Right. And, so yeah. some people say it's been around it too long, that it tries to communicate with you a little bit, or it starts messing with the frequencies in your brain. And it has to do with the crystalline structure of it. It's not so much whether, hey, it, it was ancient or non-ancient or whatever it is. 
it's the crystal itself. Because you actually have crystal in your body, your body will build it up. So I, I have gout, right? So every once in a while, my finger will get stiff, and all of a sudden, I get crystalline structure all inside the joint, and it'll stop my finger from moving, right? You also get it when you have kidney stones. You also have some crystalline structure in your brain, okay, at all times. So when we start talking about structures and crystals and stuff like that, can they communicate? Well, when you put that static electricity in the air and you give it a field in order to interact with, then, you know what I mean? It's bringing it into you. So you yeah. can taste it in your mouth. You can taste it going through you. It's going in your ears. You can't control it. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. And and because we hold the charge of it, you know, and, and hold the effect of it, walking away from it isn't quite good enough. Like, you need to be away from it, you yeah. know? And you know, I've heard of guys grounding themselves and stuff like that. I mean, for what it's worth, I mean, not that this is directly related, but I mean, I'm to me, everything is related, you know? Uh, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm deep into meditation, you know, and, uh, you know, some different spiritual aspects and stuff like that of, um, you know, metaphysics and, you know, I, I could tell you, I mean, these things, they, they do have, you know, psychological effect, uh, you know, as far as, um, that stuff goes. And, so you know, let me, let me twist your mind a little bit. We're talking about the macabre, right? Yeah. We're talking about the energy coming into it. We're talking about crystalline form. I've always said you cannot understand the energy coming out until you activate it. What mm -hmm. you have is something that has like a peg cell inside of it that's activating the energy in it. So you continuously have the energy, right? So that you're feeling the static and everything. What we're trying to accomplish when we look at the macabre in the video that I did is we want to activate the quartz crystal in the exact same way. We want to turn it on. We want those effects. We want our mind to work the machine. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we can figure out how exactly to do it. So like yeah. you're, you're feeling what's going on. Wait until you can get to the point where you can talk to it and tell it what to do. Whether you right. want to expand the field or just, you know what I mean? That's kind of thing. We, we heard Ralph Ring talk about it when they talk about the OTCX1, and they had the same thing in the crystalline form there, and then it would put out different things in the air. I think it's exactly what you're describing here. Sounds very similar, and that, that was my experience, and, um, you know, for what it's worth, uh, you know, like, uh, you can't talk about this stuff, you know, uh, to people that don't have... Uh, you know any sort of uh, background in in this or or want to to understand it you know um i even even objectively when you um show some of the effects you know it, people in my experience you know had tended to look at it and they were you know either the what what's happening is very subtle so it's like, oh, well, I mean, what's the difference? It's like, because things don't do this. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's why. That, that's why. You see, like, yeah, it's subtle. You're running your finger across something and you're feeling it starting to skip on the surface, but it's smooth. You know, yeah. it's like things don't do this and this does this. And yes, it's subtle, but it's there, you know. Um, but then there's the more extreme examples, you know, like the thing you know take taking a lift off you know and it's like it just slipped out of your hand yeah you know it's like okay look yeah it basically slipped out of my hand except you didn't feel the the torsion on my freaking hand as the thing was leaving it because that doesn't happen <laughs> you know like generally with with regular objects like you know if if you hold you know these nail clippers in your hand generally speaking it's this is it you know you push it this way it goes that way you push it this way it goes that way and the and the thing isn't going to uh, exert its own force out of my hand that you can feel on your hand <laughs> you know like this was doing that and yeah, you know right. 
things don't just do the Hutchinson effect without some kind of you know way to do it, right? Right. Which was actually, by the way, then that was another effect. It was I was kind of like it, it, it. My comfort level in talking about my physical effect, you know has been very limited i feel more comfortable in this environment talking about the physical effect seemingly that you understand you know you're kind of cooperating you know what well, i'm saying with other with other people's experiences which is great that's you know, because but, we've all experienced something like it yeah I, but I, I i fell down and i fell down when i approached it which like i'm i'm an able person yeah, <laughs> you know well, I like i was forced down like a sack of potatoes to the ground wow. and I couldn't move and I became very scared. Now, let me ask you this. Is and it, I went to the hospital and they thought I was, you know, is it more physical or mental at that point? Is there something like pulling your brain in that direction or is it like a physical and then the mental starts hitting? The mental was after. Mental was after, and you hit the physical side first. Yeah, um, you know, like I said, that was kind of making me feel heavy at times. Well, there was this one occasion where, like, I was away from it. My leg was in this excruciating pain where it felt like it was kind of like tearing muscles. I didn't like it one bit. It was come and it would go, you know, and then. Um, I had gotten up, I was fine. Okay. And with no pain, this is, and this is what was concerned with no pain at all. I'd walk by where it was at this point. I put it outside of my house, you know, and I was in that general vicinity, but still inside my house and I collapsed. But when I tell you that I collapsed, like, you know what it's like to collapse. You try to brace yourself, you know, you're falling, you're gonna, whatever. This was none of that. My body stopped moving and literally was like it forcefully felt like i was pulled to the ground um and then i couldn't move for 10 seconds 15 seconds which in that situation is like an eternity yeah you it's know heavy charge you're experiencing going in and out of a field of heavy charge and uh you know i when i um was able to start moving i was actually on the phone with my girlfriend when this happened phones out of my hand on the, what happened i called an ambulance at that point because i was like yo, I, you know i because then i started panicking am i you know what's going on and then i'm saying in the back of my head i'm like i know what it is you know because this effect that i'm busy waving my arm over the damn box that it's in and i could feel pressure on the top of my arm um right i'll move it over there um it um you know i knew that what i was physically experiencing was a very you know a macro effect of these subtle things that i had seen also occurring it was exactly the same you know i i told you when we had discussed it um before the live when you um tapped a couple pieces of these together you know it would make the normal like a normal sound like you would expect two rocks hitting each other and then whenever it would phase shift or whatever it was doing like whenever the poles would arrange in its way and it would become excited um the sound would change and the sound would go from you know the sound of uh, two quartz crystals clacking together you know to um metallic like clinking like pinging very high pitched very high frequency so check this out you got cavern and structures right mm -hmm. you're creating a rotational energy and it flows okay so think of it as like water but thin right it doesn't have a lot of viscos viscosity to it. it goes into the cavern and swirls as it does it makes a frequency it hits a different cavern, and then it makes a different frequency. Then it hits a different cavern, makes a different frequency. Each one of them changes the height of the frequency. So it'll go very high. It'll go very low. 
But when you change the frequency, it changes between static and, and magnetic. So as you're very high, you get a very high static frequency, which will shove you to the ground. When you get it very low, it'll put in more of a magnetic frequency and things will start moving around it. it it's the hardest thing to describe to somebody who hasn't felt it to get them to understand what you're talking about. Because I do it all the time. I fill up my entire garage with static electricity. So I know exactly where the fields are. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. I, I deal with the gravity flyer, which puts it out in the field. I can put my hand in and it'll completely change from one side to the other. It, it's like putting it in a mirror that you can touch through. It's completely different on the other side than mm -hmm. it is on this side. And, and that that's kind of cool because it struck me when you said it. I feel the same thing. I, I get that exact same feeling. You know what I mean? The push to the ground, everything. And then you get out of that so, sort of frequency that you're in and your body likes it better. And, and your body reacts like it's a good thing. And, and you start feeling like you're energetic and you got a little more energy. You go back into the bad side and everything hurts. Like oh, every single bone hurts. That's every exactly it. it and and, and in, in your mind too, like, which is crazy because, you know, sometimes, you know, it's like, it'll give you this like almost tunnel vision focus on something with like, you know, when it's a good mood and, you know, it's like, okay, you know, whatever. And then other times it just, it, you know, the vi whatever frequency it's, it's at at that point, you know, it's, it's bad, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, and it's so, and maybe it's not bad. Maybe it's just so powerful, you know, like there's a difference, like too much of anything is like overwhelming, you know, you overload our limited senses here and it's like, it becomes bad, you know? And uh, I think that that's sort of what it, um, what my experience with it was. Um, I, there was the other thing I was telling you too, which is after I had uh, drilled out a whole bunch of cores out of this and I had all these little cores, you know, um, and then I had the larger piece. I put it into, um, it was a wooden jewelry box. It was nothing special. It was a wooden box, you know, with a glass see-through top that, you know, it's meant for gifts, you know, like you slip a, you know, and it printed out a picture under something under it, you know, and, yeah. um, you know, I it had a brass, you know, clasp type, um, whatever. So I put all the pieces in this box and, and closed it and you could put a piece of like you know uh, plywood small little piece of plywood you know eighth inch on top you know you could I, I even had like some sheet rubber and took some sheet rubber put it on top and then you could take non-metallic non-conductive any anything you could put anything on top of this and shook the box a little bit so the pieces kind of you know <laughs> got in their way and then if you if you just like took um you know like here's a business card you know you take you take a card for instance and you just rub it back and forth slowly rotate it maybe circularly and then all of a sudden you would notice oh this thing stuck to it like it like it has a 10 pound weight on top of it other times you would go like that and it would literally be hovering over the surface this end lifting up that end lifting up you know, and it had that effect. Um, one experiment that I did, I did a few that I didn't get to tell you about because we got cut short when I had to go to that work meeting. But um, I took um, a, a coaster, um, a, a cork coaster, and just um, a f measured out center and poked a hole and uh, put a fishing line to it and just held it and, you know, mounted it to something so it was still, made sure there's no moving air or anything like that. And just... I had a sheet of all, uh, like a metal sheet, cookie sheet or whatever that I put these bits and pieces on. And um, I just observed, you know, shook it around a little bit. Well, what's the, what's the coaster doing? You know, and the coaster would contort itself like that. Oh, that's so cool. You know, where it really got crazy, and this is super subjective because it's not like I'm, I'm not a professional. I don't have like a high speed camera or anything like that, but I could tell you what I've observed. And, you know, I would take this and I would just rotate it above this cookie sheet like that, right? And 
it would ride the field. Nice. It would ride the field. Now, if you sped it up, what you noticed was as it was at, uh, you know, obviously when you're spinning something, it's going to be in like an ellipse, you know? Yeah. Well, when it's out of the best field that this was putting off, okay, it would go like you would expect, but as it would go through the field, it would wildly accelerate. Like there was no resistance so whatsoever. When, when you hit the outside of the field, it accelerated. When, okay, no, when it crossed into the field, into the field okay. it accelerated. When it crossed gotcha. into the field, it, it, well, it's hard for me to say because, mind you, in that, like, I don't know what the field looks like. You know, I mean, and my, and because of how all the pieces are broken up, even if you kind of had your head around it, I mean, it's such a complex, you know, amount of pieces and of, of obscure shapes and different positions and so on and so forth that visualizing this field is like because it could be multiple fields and you don't know where many, many feet right exactly so but all i could tell you is that when it would cross into the path of this pan it almost felt fr like frictionless like it like it was slicing and it would go fast and it, it would go fast and it wouldn't drop it would often gain altitude so it, it had like this like it's going up but it's okay um here like here it is right yeah i can see it's got a field going around it. now when it goes through the field it comes around here's a come oh no other way because it's reversed um here it is coming around the corner right now it's out of the field now it gets into the field it's lifting up and slicing and then coming kind of back down, but it's able to maintain it enough that as it continues to rotate, it's now lifted up like this and no, no, like that. So it's sideways. So you're, you're playing in between two fields. It sounds like it sounds like one's here and one's like this. And as you come in, it's starting to flow in between the two of them. So I, all I could, yes, but, you know, it would also vary because of the nature of everything that I've been saying, you know, um, but the, the general experience is that any time that this, um, uh, you know, cork um, coaster would come into the vicinity of that, that it was uh, uh, traveling through the air with much less resistance. Okay. Felt, you know, felt um and it would also change the sound of it too it would go you know it would like cutting almost um so that was that another thing i did which <laughs> this was a bit weird i um took a dremel tool okay and i um took a it's like it was a piece to my daughter's bottle like, you know, the pressure release thing, whatever. It's like round and it's got a nipple on it. You know, so I okay. stuck the nipple into the, and I, and I fastened that into the Dremel with a piece of steel that I just wedged in there to keep it. And I glued a piece of the stone into the middle of this to keep it spinning on axis. And since it was a plug, it was spinning relatively, I mean, it wasn't balanced, but, you know, it was spinning fast in the center of this piece. And I just decided to turn my Dremel on and hold it above the neodymium magnet <laughs> and i as soon as i started doing it it started accelerating the rpm <laughs> on my on my dremel tool so it went faster than it's supposed to go it, it, right it, i have one of the dremel tools that you know under load it's supposed to compensate for that okay. load and increase the rpm you know what i mean so what it was that caused it, whether it was like some type of um, physical phenomena of the environment or whether it was interference, direct interference with the motor or whether it was causing a load on the bit, you know, and then causing the computer to inter interject and increase the RPM. It could have been any one of those variables. 
But I could tell you one thing, I've been using that machine for a number of years and you turn it on and unless if you're putting load on it, it's not changing its thing. If you turn it on and it's got the bid in or whatever it is, that's the RPM it's spinning. So check this out. You wouldn't notice it like you would think it'd just be the magnet, right? So here, here's the crazy thing. W with these crystals that I've noticed, you think it could do it without it, but as soon as it's gone, the effect goes away. So if you just held the magnet there and you had your Dremel running, it probably wouldn't put any load on it. No, right? None at all. I could, I could attest to that. No load. No load. But when no the load. crystalline structure is there, you got a load. Correct. Okay. Now check this out. Uh, I'll tell you the experiment I did in my kitchen. I took little bowls of water. I put a piece of granite in the bowl of water. You could take your multimeter over to it and it'll show it as conductive. Okay. Now you can put multiple bowls of water and put the granite in each one. Now you would think, okay, is it the water making it conductive? Remove the granite and the number goes away. It's no longer conductive. Okay. Now what's going on? Well, I live in California. They put fluoride in the water. So we're getting fluoride just like you would with rainwater. So what's going on is the fluoride interacting chemically in that structure of the crystalline, causing it to resonate, causing conductivity. Okay. So when you remove the granite, the water goes blank. There's no conductivity, even though it's all hooked up exactly the same. Put the granite pieces back in, conductivity, right? Here's the strange thing. When you leave your multimeter on it, the conductivity keeps growing. Higher, 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 higher until you use it. And then the conductivity goes down to nothing. Okay. But if you let it build high enough, okay. And I had my sink fixed. It was doing water hammer. Okay. As soon as I turned on and off my sink, because it was just getting a glass of water while the test was running, it sent out a pulse wave because it hit it so hard with that water hammer. Because the water pressure was like three times the, the amount that it should have been. Right. Oh, so I, had to, I had to get it fixed. It sent a pulse wave throughout my kitchen. Now you think it wouldn't be much, right? But it's just like a uh, excuse me, an ultrasound machine on a piece of piezoelectricity, okay? Piezoelectric disc, it had the same effect. It put out a pulse wave throughout the entire kitchen and set my meter skyrocketing, okay? Yeah. Completely amazing, once in a lifetime kind of experience, you know what I mean? But ever since then, I've always had it in my head if you can take a piezoelectric disc because it has this crystalline in it, right? And you can pulse it with that uh, ultrasound-like machine because it does the same thing as water hammer. It's putting out that pulse wave, okay? Mm -hmm. It'll fire up that uh, quartz inside the granite. The granite already puts the pressure around it. You don't need to change that. All you need to do is activate it. Well, a couple, couple of interesting notes on what you were saying, just on my own you know, knowledge base. My ex-wife um, was actually a, a, a sonographer, um, you know, an ultrasound tech. And, you know, she went to school for that. And I helped her through the school. They had to read, um, you know, the definitive guide on ultrasound um, physics, you know, which has nothing to do with the job. It's just they, I guess, want, you know, their text to have the understanding of, you know. That. Oh. Of course, I found that to be interesting you know and um i helped her in her studies and learned a lot about it in that way um it's funny because she always said they're like oh well they tell us in school don't even try to understand it just memorize it um you know because you're never going to really need this but you need to be able to pass it in order to get your certifications you know and me i was like why would you want to friggin read something not not want to understand it you know right. and at that point in my life because i mean this is going back now like 14 15 years you know i didn't have like any real reason to want to know this other than my stabbing curiosity of everything so um you know when helping her with her studies i actually ended up understanding so many of those concepts um you know is uh, at fundamental levels and one thing that really struck me was um you know ultrasonic cavitation you know, and 
when you start looking into ultrasonic cavitation, even, even if you were not to look at these high power diagnostic machines that they have that transducers could put out, like I, mind you what it's doing, it's looking through you and being able to report that back through the transducer, you know, which is a pretty incredible feat it takes very, very, very high frequency to do that. You know? Yeah. Um, when you're, uh, looking at a, at a more attainable way to be able to tap into those technologies, you know, they have, um, fairly decent quality, like fat cavitation machines now that will give you a system with, you know, pulse vacuum, you know, infrared and ultrasound, you know, wands and stuff that are totally affixable. And, you know, they, to get into one that would be of any practical, you know, use, um, you know, you're probably looking at spending 750 or a thousand, but when you're thinking about what it does, you know, um, you know, and it's output and whatnot, uh, so something like that could potentially, you know, with, uh, you know, the, the crystal structures and as I had brought up on a couple of occasions, like electrolyte solutions and things of that nature. I, th I think that, you know, those technologies could be, um, you know, incredible, you know, and one thing in that, you know, I think is worth out of this discussion is this, right. You know, we're sharing our experiences as to these, you know, subjective and objective physical and observable phenomena that we have working with these static fields and, you know, in, in, in these conditions, you know, what blows my mind is the, the parallel and the experience, except, you know, what you're running is like, you know, it's, it's like systems, you know, this is a, this is a rock. <laughs> it's not hooked up to anything. It's not, you're not inputting anything into it except for, you know, maybe, um, pausing its excitement, you know? uh which frankly could just happen on its own anyway well what's cool about it is it's got everything that i'm building in it already that's what's awesome right that's what's amazing <laughs> right. I mean, it's, you, it's all it's all there and it's nothing right nothing doing <laughs> yeah they they can it's like a, a chemistry experiment put into a rock you know I mean, caverns and piezo and everything that you want in this thing is right there that's what i love after i collapse you should have heard me trying to explain this to a medical doctor no you're not going to and then as i'm telling them because i brought up the samples of the rock with me because at that point i like i knew what was going on but i wasn't certain and i was like yo if i'm having a medical crisis i want them to at least be able to see what it is that is causing it for me you know and that for them, they thought I was out of my mind. I'm telling you, right? They did a psych evaluation on me, like which, and I'm explaining to them. I'm like, no, you don't understand. This has fluctuating static fields. It's piezoelectric. Uh, you know, uh, I was like, if, if you stimulate it in any sort of way, it puts out an electrical charge. I was like, the un the electrical charges are unpredictable. I was like, it's having adverse effect on me. I don't want to pretend like I like I know exactly what I'm talking about. I was like. That there's something going on with this that I somewhat understand and I'm willing to explain to you. They're like, what are you talking about? You know, they're like, this is a rock in a box. And they had the nerve after I'm complaining of the symptoms and saying what I believe it is. And I'm not saying it is this. I'm saying, I think it might have to do with this. I'm not sure, but here it is just in case. That's yeah. my whole spiel on it, you know? But they take the thing and they put it underneath my hospital bed. And I'm like, can you get, can you get that shit away from me? I'm telling you it, you know, like that it might be causing me all these issues and you have it underneath. They're like, well, what do you want us to do with it? I was like, frankly, I don't know. I don't care. Can you test to see if it's radioactive? I was like, cause I don't know if it's radioactive or not. I was like, and honestly, if it's radioactive and that's whatever. And then they're like, well, why do you think it's the rock? I'm like, well, I, I don't, I, I knew it was, but. I didn't want to make these definitive claims to them because then 
at that point they're probably going to commit me. <laughs> and yeah. the, 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 re, I'm reading. I'm reading the room, and I could tell where it's going. And I'm like, I, I can't be so definitive about this. And you know, what do I really know anyway? You know. So I said to them, I was like, listen, I I don't know that it's this. I was like, but let me let me ask you this: if I if I ate a bowl of cereal, and it tasted a little funny, you know, and then I got these wrenching stomach pains, and was sick and throwing up all over the place. Would it be strange if I brought the box of cereal with me and said, this is the, this is the cereal that might have caused me to be sick? Can you see if there's something going on with the cereal? Because you, you wouldn't sit there and psyche eval that person, you know? No. You'd be like, oh, well, that's, you know, right. Oh, look, the cereal is contaminated. Now we could treat you because now we know what's wrong. They just don't understand it. They didn't want to understand it. <laughs> you know, fortunately, I mean, I, because I was able to articulate this, you know, like, okay, yeah, fine. You're not crazy, but like, you know, I'm probably fucking crazy. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> that's, well, sort of you know, yeah, it takes someone who's actually experienced to understand it. You know what I mean? Yeah, but be me, but be me in that situation talking to a doctor, you know, and, like I hate to say it, like they're putting themselves here as the as the expert. Yeah, and I'm like, yes, ex like a, in 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 the most ginger way possible, you know, to be like expert of my body, why I'm here. But you also don't know what's wrong with me, and I'm just simply providing information that I know. You know. Yeah, I, I think it's opposite though. You're the expert here. They're a toddler here. They have no idea what you're No doing. idea. None. None. And I knew that, And uh, but they weren't looking at it that way. In, in their mind, they were the person. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so it's like, oh, okay. Whatever. That's, why, that's why a lot of us that do this kind of stuff, if it doesn't kill you, you just kind of move on. You don't try to tell anybody about it unless you're in the group setting like this. You know what I mean? Where somebody understands it. Because my wife doesn't understand it. My kids don't understand what I do. They, they don't get any part of it. But in this setting, everybody else starts to understand where I'm going with it. You know what I mean? Because their experiences have seen parts of it. You know what I mean? Little parts, little fragments. And then they can start to put together where I'm at. And that's why I always explain things in general terms. Because that way everybody can say, okay, yeah, I got that point. Now I see it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's it, it's very much like, you know, I'm an artist too. It's very much like showing somebody, you know, uh, the beginning stages of a, of a piece of art. You know, it's like yeah, you, you could see it's there and see what it's trying to be, but it don't look all too good. And honestly, if, if you kind of don't know the process and know all what's behind building it up into what it's ultimately going to be, then it really the only thing that the layperson sees is something that uh, it doesn't look good. And okay. they can't fathom how it would look good with what you're about to do to it, <laughs> you know? Um, and it's very similar here. It's almost like if you don't have, like if you're not sucking energy out of the zero point and running high-end electronics off of something not plugged into a wall, then, then, you know, everything that you did to get it to that point was just conspiracy nonsense up until that point. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's so like, to take your art analogy, when you do a portrait in reverse, so instead of drawing out all the lines for the face, instead of drawing out the nose line, the eyes, right? You do it in reverse, right? Always how I do. So so you're over there, you're making the marks that looks like the shadows up here, the shadows here, the shadow around here. So you never actually draw the person. You're just drawing everything around. It's it. the underpainting. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's the building of the structure underneath, you know, of, of what it is. And right. The, the shadows of where the, the cheekbone, you know, meets the side of the head is a funny looking thing when there's no skin on top of it and yeah. no, and, and no, um, you know, uh, flesh tone or anything like that. And, you know, it's right. It's a perfect analogy for what all this is. Yeah. Cause know? when you're doing art, you have to learn to add those things. 
But when you become an artist, you add those things naturally and don't need the rest. You see it differently, you know, yeah. you see it differently. You, you know, it's, um, you, you look at things from its, from its structure, you know, before you look at it from its, um, you know, what is most apparent, you know, which is the end result, you know, it's right. Those bone structures underneath your flesh when you're painting is, you know, that's more important than anything because you could take you know, mix yourself up with a peach color and put it onto an oval and it'll look like a face. It'll look like a really, you know, simple, it's one of the things I, I know when I, when with nothing. I did, yeah. When I did art class, it was one of those things that everybody struggled with and I just breezed right through it. It was, it was something that they couldn't understand how the form that you see versus the lines that you see and that the outer side is just lines. And anybody can draw them. It's like drawing Fred Flintstone, right? You can draw them it's real quick, real easy. You can see it. What gives it character is the different colors and the how they're moved and how they're shaped and the lines they create as each brush stroke goes. Each one of the lines in the brush stroke makes something that is unique. So that's a little bit on the yeah. art side. However, when we talk about static electricity and things like this when you're building it, don't really need high voltage like it produces high voltage but you don't need to put high voltage into it i can take five volts and make it high voltage it's just that simple you don't right. need a lot what you need is the understanding of how they interact and work together to make that next level right so let me ask you this out of this material you know, as far as like a practical use, I know when you're live the other day, um, there was that, um, the, the double jump, right? Yeah. So I think the challenge with that double jump, you know, I mean, there's so many, <laughs> you know, just achieving that in the first place. Um, but the, the, there's got to be this uh, balance, I feel like, you know, between um modulation of you know magnetic fields um electrically you know through coils and induction uh but there's also got to be solid state elements to that too to bridge the gap um i think without one and the other you know you're just you have opposing forces with nowhere for it to go to get that third jump you know so, let me explain it in this way Okay, I'll take this coast. And it's got to be an oscillation, too. I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's got to be an oscillation because that would be the movement is the oscillation. That that oscillation could be extremely small, yeah, but rapid. This is what made Gerald's experiment so incredible, okay? You have a field. Your object is levitating above the field. Then he raises it a second time. What does that mean? It means that in between the first and second one, the actual field stayed. Now he builds a field on top of it. Now, he's very doing very slow work right here, right? What if I rapidly produce that field? Then I can just continue to build the field up until this goes away, right? So what he's doing is showing you one field. Now he's showing you the invisible part in the center where he has two fields. Mm -hmm. It's not one big field, it's two fields. So, field, jump, field. Okay, now I got two fields. What if I keep continuously making fields? I keep going up. Well, is that is that where is that where 369 comes in? I, you know, I don't, you I know, don't is, know. I, I mean, is that where 369 comes in? You know, the you, you need it at one step to the next step. You need to be able to push it one more time in order for the cycle to continue from the bottom. So what, you know? he's showing, what he's showing is the field staying, right? Right. And another field staying. But you don't need to keep them staying. You can dissolve the field on the bottom and continue that field on the top. You're rapidly building a field under it. You get what I'm saying? I do. Again, again, what, again, now, again, again. Sorry if I missed this. What is that in, now in context? 
So what is that um, bottom field, we'll call it, you know, what is that acting upon after it gets to a certain point? It, it's like you just throw the magnets away. Once you build a field on top of a field, you don't need the magnet. That's the whole point here. You right. No, I know that's the whole point, but I mean, maybe that's where I was disconnected. Yeah. You're creating a field bubble. It, it's telling you the understanding of a field bubble. So if you can build a field bubble, that's your magnetic field. You don't need it to have structure around it to build it. You don't need the magnet. All you need to do is build the field bubble. That's right. why the second lift was so important on it because right. you're putting the field bubble under it. Now, I'm working inside of a field bubble in my experiment, right? So all I need to do is bounce the bubble and I'll go up. On his, all you need to do is create another field bubble under it again and again and again, and it continues to rise. Mm -hmm. it, one of the ways you can create anti-gravity, the total field bubble is another way. So it, it, I, it's hard to understand, but to say it's like a balloon, right? You put hot air in the balloon, it becomes anti-gravity, right? Because it'll move however you want it to. The field bubble is the same way. All you're doing is creating a balloon, but you're filling it with a bunch of hot electrostatic air. Now, the things that are inside of it carry a different weight than the outside portion because you just removed it from the gravitational field. Understood. Yeah, so that's what he's doing. It's a bubble on top of a bubble, and he's going to continue. And if you can make it rapid, rapid change. You can immediately keep creating bubbles underneath it. Well, and that's where I was going with that is, is you know, that, that modulation of being able to, at that frequency, build on top. Now, I have a stupid question. I don't know if it's, uh, it's so rudimentary, I suppose, but uh, like I, I've always had a hard time getting my head around this. And, you know, at the, at the dead center of the earth, what's the gravity there? You know, because like, look at, look at like uh, at a DORPA. You, have you ever heard of that book? Yes. Right. So I've at a door book. You fall, you fall, you fall until you don't fall anymore. You know, and I mean, if you think about the earth as like, you know, a big ass gravitron spinning around with centrifugal force, you know, and also spiraling in other moment, levels of momentum. I mean, realistically, you know, I, I in my opinion, you know that's what gravity is you know uh, realistically uh, that I, I think that they have a hard time proving that but i don't know you know there is any gravity at the center right i think it's in the bubble it creates on the outside it's I on the bubble so we're right so we are the bubble is the point right well the the way that i see it is you got a frequency chamber in the center right or some kind of thing that creates the bubbles right and then it creates one, it creates another, creates another, and creates another, right? We're in between two fields of the bubble sitting on a dielectric plane is where we're at. We're on the crust. Mm -hmm. We're in between two. So if you drill down, you're going to hit a big frequency spot that's going to have strange attributes. Why? Because it's one right above it, okay? That's the only way this works. That's the only way that they're going to create gravity because it's just basically the negative coming down trying to find the positive every time. That's what gravity is, okay? Mm -hmm. We're sitting on a dielectric. like So we're sitting on the table. When I activate high voltage, it'll suck it down to the table. Just like you realize with your rock, it'll bring it down and suck it down to the, to the table, right? That's all that's going on here. That's all that gravity is. In order to break that is you need to create something that's separate from that and go out from it. But getting back to the core of it, I don't know that there's gravity in the core the gravity comes because you created two fields. You create an inner and an outer field. But how it creates it, I don't believe it may have gravity at all. No, that and that's where I'm going. Gravity, I I don't believe that gravity is personally a thing. I think it's more just like like you said, you know, the acting of of the, the force fields of of the rotations, you know, um, which is weird because like I mean, I'm not a mathematician. <laughs> You know, I can't really off the, you know, in any reasonable form, conjure the calculation, 
you know, but you know, my logic tells me that if you're able to calculate the um, the spin of the Earth and then the trajectory and speed in which it's traveling in space, you know, and then you look at the the circumference of the Earth and you look at the um, you know the relevant portion of the crust, you know, and its curvature. That if you're able to plug all that information into an equation, you're going to come up with, you know, gra a gra an equation for the effects of gravity as we know them. Yeah, but they now, don't. They don't understand how to build the field, and so they can't quantify it. Well, right, but the field would be built based on those basic principle fundamentals. I in my, I mean, again, what do I? I don't claim to know anything. It's just a, you know. The guy well, inside there talking to me, but it, it okay. In order to create the field, I'll just tell you: you have to rotate a Tesla coil. There's there's a simple way to do it. I do it on my gravity flyer. I have two spinning plates, plate on top, plate on the bottom, right? If I take the wire and I connect it to the plate on top, run it through the Tesla coil and to the bottom, right? I don't even connect it to the Tesla coil. I'm just going to go through the center of it, okay? Uh, I'm basically stealing energy from it. All I'm doing is now those things spin. As they spin, they create a field bubble. That's it. That's what it is. Okay. That right there, it holds in the static. That's all that it does. So the only thing you have to realize is you have to spin something. Just like the Earth has to spin. If the Earth didn't spin, that field bubble wouldn't be there. Right. And if you look deeper into it, the only thing a Tesla coil is, is a pulsed field on top of a field. That's it. In its most basic level. You don't need wires going up like this. You don't need a wire going like this on the outside. You need a pulsed field. That's it. That creates a field inside of another one. You can use rocks to achieve it if you can get a pulse field through it. It right. does not matter. But but now in like how how does this all tie in together as far as you know uh, extracting energy from from the ether you know like how how is like I mean I understand some basics about how that could be creation but not without the lack of mechanical force so it becomes not necessarily a perpetual motion or or a passive extraction it becomes a mechanical one so i mean is there anything that you know that as far as how to how to get that um free charge you know and and actually hold it without moving everything around yes amen you can yes uh you can always create a vortex in solid state the problem with the solid state, it doesn't have the field bubble on the outside. However, if you simply just wanted to create the energy inside, the only thing you do is create the vortex, okay? So let me see if I got a picture here for you. Give me a second, and I'll try to bring something up because it's relevant mm -hmm. in how you see it. All right, cool. Where are we live on, by the way? I don't... Uh, we're just live on uh, – uh, oh, it's got me going uh, – YouTube. Oh, cool. Do we have viewers? Yes, we do. Nice. They're so, saying anything nice? <laughs> I don't see the chat. I'm only in this. <laughs> oh, look over to your, uh, I believe it's your right. There should be a chat thing right there. Just click over to the corner. It's a oh, okay. chat. And not the private one, but the other one. And you should ah. be able to see the chat. You can answer some questions here if you want while I'm looking this up. All right, cool. So... Let me see. Let me see. Come on. I had it this morning. Oh, there. I'm not Nathan's brother. <laughs> as far as I know, you know, I mean, you know, it's... you never know how things pan out, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you you, you <laughs> never know, you know, it's maybe, maybe we're not brothers. Maybe we're just the same person living a different life. There you go. Okay. So, all you need here. Basically, across the center here, 
is a coil. Okay. Oh, hold on. Let me let me cross out the chat. Okay. It'd be multiple coils. Okay. Okay. Inside here in the center is your vacuum, right? This is where your vacuum happens. You can see the field around it. Okay. Right there. Always always goes around it. Now, this is a spiral. When I say that, just understand. You see my cursor on the screen? Uh yes. Okay, it spirals. Then it moves the spiral, right? Now we're just going to go off at a different degree, and it moves the spiral, and then spiral, and it's a continuous spiral. Now, that's not the only spiral in it. Multiply that by about 200, and everyone starts, but it doesn't stop. It never finds its tail, right? So as you bring this along, you start to see the other fields build. They'll continue to build out, build out, build out until you get to the end here. You see all this in here, the little light purple stuff? Yeah, the outside of the torus there, yeah. That's your static right there. Okay. okay. That That's what it is. Now, the outside line right here represents if you had a Tesla coil connected to it, you would get the Tesla coil in here. But it doesn't stop this inner field from going into the vortex here. You see it? I, I do, yeah. So... The outside vortex would be the Tesla coil. The inside vortex would be your main coil in here, okay? But it would continuously do the same process. That's the understanding of it. So do you want the energy? Right in the center, it turns cold. Right on the outside, it starts to get hotter. That's why the energy becomes less. It's a static energy. It starts to become less as you pull it out here until you can get to a magnetic bubble on the outside and hold it in. Okay, so I I'm, I don't want to interrupt really, but I just wanted to, for understanding because now I'm I'm kind of tying this into something that was said on one of the live streams the other day. This is um the point where you have to build that center to the point just prior to discharge, and then basically capture it just before it becomes visible before it before it arcs. Is that? Yeah. That's so, the relevance. So so, so how do you do that? How do you capture that center before it discharges? The thing is, is it's continuously going around, right? Yeah. So the inside is continuously getting the energy. All you need to do is put a wire to it or anything else no shit. and bleed it off. So okay. if you've ever taken a wire and put it down a testicle, right? It is cold energy when it comes off of there, okay? So what does that mean? It's a robber circuit. It basically steals energy from your Tesla coil. And your, as your Tesla coil oscillates, it brings up energy and then discharges it, right? Well, instead of that discharge, you're stealing that energy, okay? But it's in cold form because it's a robber circuit, okay? It, all it does, that wire goes in there, is stealing that energy. So you have to think of this bubble as the same way. If I simply stuck something in the middle right there where the vortex is going on, I can take all the energy that I want. Okay. Every bit that it produces, I can take it. All I have to do is know how to form it correctly in order to get the highest intensity possible. In doing that, you have to create field geometry. Your geometry dictates what it does. So remember the caverns you were talking about? Mm -hmm. I told you each one resonates differently. Get the highest value one that resonates the most, put it in, and it's just like this. The energy in the center will be much bigger than it is anywhere else. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, no, yeah, I do. It's, so, it, so, it, it's perplexing because, I mean, not for anything, it, nothing about this is simple without the fundamentals. But, I mean, that's a very simple answer to what, <laughs> you know, whatever I was thinking was way more complicated. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, right. Well, just imagine it like this. Say it's your core, right, uh, of your uh, generator. Mm -hmm. and at the dead center of the core, let me just take this off of the screen right here. Um, all I want to do is I want to imagine it. So instead of imagining it's a solid core, solid piece of iron, right, I want to put individual pieces of iron in there, just little round cylinders of iron, right? That's what's going on. Now, if, if I thought that through and I said, okay, let me take that piece that's on the inside and let me extend it all the way around and go to an, the next piece of iron, right? Then to the next and the next, right? 
the outside pieces would be like way far apart, right? But the inside would be so tightly compact in there, you'd be trying to find places to put the wire, right? It, it would be like, I can't get another one in, Nathan. I can't get another one in, right? But the outside has plenty of space. That's what you're creating here. So, so like, I mean, what about like uh, in the iron, uh, you know, if it's well, like uh, octagonal let, let and me pointed. Like this. Sorry, pardon me. It's condensing the amount of energy into a very high level in the center. Okay. In a very weak level on the outside. So the bigger you get it on the outside means it has more field lines. It's like if I took all these Q-tips right here, right? And I put them in there. And that's my center. That's my core. Okay. Each individual one goes out. But every time that I build the line on the outside, I'm building more and more and more and more. So in there, in the center, there gets more and more and more and more and more and more. Right. And you're like, okay, now it's so intense in there that you, you know what I mean? That energy is so compact. It could be 700 volts on the inside by being 100 volts on the outside because you're picking up barely any out here. You're picking up all of it in the center. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, that, and obviously because it all concentrates in that field in that manner where it, it is bottlenecking more or yes. less coming in onto itself within the torus and it, within that bottleneck where it reaches that, that most finite point, that's, that's your point. Yeah, and that's that's also the point of the extraction. The extraction being as simple as your your little, you know, iron array. Just a simple wire to the real center of it, it'll extract it right away. Now, whatever you put in there, based on your wire, your you know, I mean, if you put a core in there, something that picks it up, you can get more energy, right? You put it in a simple wire. I can connect that to the outside of a UFO. Or, or a you know what I mean just a basic shape mm -hmm. as that thing rotates I now have my Tesla coil field because in order to get a vortex you have to form some sort of Tesla coil in the center of it that's the point you don't need the way a Tesla coil is built you need to understand how it's built right and if you can build that into your coil you automatically have your vortex that's the point. It's you have to change your thinking. And it's like a whole explosion that goes on in your mind when you understand that concept. You are literally building a testicle without knowing you're building the testicle and it operates the same way. And I'm taking that one wire and stealing all of the energy or just some of it, putting it on the outside. Now I can rotate it and create a field charge outside of it. So I can do everything solid state as long as the outside rotates just slightly. Doesn't have to go fast. Can be very slight. Okay. Okay. Because, matter of fact, the bigger it is, the slower it rotates. That's it. Because you don't. You, you just need the field charge there. You may not even need to rotate it. It may just need to be there to hold it. Matter of fact, I don't think it needs to rotate. You can have it sitting on the outside as long as it's charged to hold in because it's basically just a bubble. So you could build the bubble out by rotating it or you can leave it right on the surface of it and not let the static electricity go out of it. You don't want that thing that's going on like this to leave. You want it to fill up in a cavern. Does that make sense? You, you yeah. want to compress it. You want it to be hard for it to fill it up. That's the point. So tying all the bits and ends together, you know, we were talking about your machine, um, you know, and the fact that your room is your field at this point. Once you get that properly contained, you know, we were talking about some different cladding materials and the, the, the video that I had come across. And then I think on the, the live chats from a couple of days ago, I brought up just, um, you know, I guess having my own, biases of curiosity also you know uh, with the materials you know what well, what might best contain this to to you know do it and we were talking about that clad you know um one clad being like copper um copper aluminum and then we you know with a with a crystal core um so, check this out 
the main thing you got to understand is you want a material that hates electricity. That's yeah. what you want. That's really what you want. Anything that has any magnetic value, it wants to hate yeah, it. Yeah, well, the, the aluminum would be that. That there you go. Okay. It always holds the charge a little bit on the outside. Okay. That's the point of the aluminum. It's energy and copper goes into the copper and stays in the copper. For a field, it sucks. It's great to have energy inside of it to, to contain the energy, but it really sucks if you want a field. So if you say iron, the same thing, it's even worse. Okay. It mm -hmm. makes that iron magnetic. It makes it worse. Aluminum is great or titanium, whichever one, it pushes it off. It doesn't yep. like to stay there. That's the whole point of the field is you don't want it attached. You want it off a little off bit. Of, it has to be off of or else what are you acting against? You're that's acting against great. your own vessel. I mean, that sounds like a good way to, you know, yeah. so, <laughs> have a catastrophic failure is what it would be. Now, now let's take this in reverse, okay? I want the field on the outside. I want the aluminum on the outside. I need a layer that's going to act as an insulator, okay? That's not always active, but they can become active, okay? That's why crystalline structure is so important in that. You have to have some sort of crystalline, bismuth, any kind of thing like that that you can have in that right there. Then you have to have the inner portion where the static is going on. That portion has to contain the static as well. So the field also has to be inside a little bit in order to contain that static electricity. Well, and that's why I was saying Rochelle salt is an interesting, um, and maybe even like magnesium doped um, Rochelle salt, you know, um, with a higher magnesium content, um, you know, it's crystal and it could be formed and it could be formed, you know, not in a crazy laboratory setting. It could also be used as a coating. And, um, you know, I think as we were kind of discussing too, you know, having that uh, crystal layer have some interpermeability into either side of the clad, you know, could probably be readily achieved with like, um, you know, acid treating um, the, the surfaces, creating, um, you know, <laughs> ironically, it go always goes full circle. It's a, a cavernous pitted, um, you know, inner surface for it to bond to. Um, it's not the strongest thing on the planet, but at the end of the day, like, you know, that could probably be overcome by, um, you know, insulating, uh, just like, you know, it would have to be patterned, you know, like the, the crystals could be connected in, in a, in a way that falls within some type of maybe 3d printed structure, well, um, or something. You know, if, if, if you pre-etch it, right. Is what you're talking acid etching. Mm hmm you pre-etch it, right, on both sides. Now, here's the thing. If I put the mixture for the crystalline structure, right, even if I bought the little kit from the store, right, and I put it in the microwave and I can create the crystal, right, that same thing, even if I just do that and just acid etched everything, all I have to do is add a microwave to it in order for that crystal structure to continuously grow, right? Mm -hmm. All a microwave is, is a magnetic field and a magnetic field that'll hold it in. It's a resonance chamber in the center and you're taking that resonance chamber of energy and pushing it out, right? So when we're dealing with electrostatics in a vortex inside a cavity, we are already creating it because the outside is like a testicle of a magnetic field and the magnetic field rotates based on the testicle, right? So now understand this, we're basically building a magnetron in there. So as that crystalline structure is in there, it'll grow naturally and it'll continue to grow. As a matter of fact, the acid etching is only beginning. It'll continue to grow into each part of the aluminum. So if you're layering aluminum. So, uh, pardon me to interrupt, but just for my yeah. understanding, like a like almost like an like an amalgamation almost is what you're describing is a at yeah. that point, like it, it's alloying itself. Yes. It's doing it without you doing it. It's it's how it's built. It's It's got to have the three layers. And in order to do that, all you need to do is put in the correct energy for the actual crystalline to grow. Now, and, it, it just um, 
curiosity because I had mentioned this and you know didn't really get my head around my own ideas. Maybe you could make sense of my own ideas. That'd there you be go. cool. Um, it, you know, if you were to take a ceramics, okay, you make a ceramic slurry, and you dope the ceramic slurry with um, you know different mineral content that would best suit your needs. You layer um, and dry each compound for the next stain skim coats however much at that point you could dry it fire it and probably have a you know layered compound material that also follows whatever structure you want it to because you can mold out the structures and so on um to have the attributes that you want um all while running it through a semiconductor yeah it's a semiconductor is what you're building by the way yeah it's a it's a semiconductor except you know, you could make it more or less conductive yeah, or not at all, depending on what you add into the ceramic mixture. Not to mention the fact that, it, you know, ceramic in its native form, I mean, is, is a holder of very high resonance, you know, which probably could, you know, be a, be a proactive um, contributing factor to that as well. Well, ceramics would work great, except for they break easy. They break the easy, yeah. Yeah, the crystalline structure doesn't. Yeah, that's it true. Gives you, it gives you the same semiconductor until you reach a point where you activate it. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh, then I got gotcha. you. Then it creates a different field altogether, and we'd have to try every single one of them to find out the right one. Yeah. And, yeah. and when, when you took it, the, they had the Roswell piece on uh, – Oh, man, what was it? They were doing it on one of the other channels, and they were showing the parts of it, right? On APAC, I think it was. And they had the metal. They had the layer of crystalline, and they said it was bismuth. They had it tested. And then the other thing of metal is aluminum, bismuth, aluminum. Okay? I'm, not, I'm surprised it didn't come out as titanium. Okay? But it was the same type of structure. That's what they said they found in the Roswell thing. And that was through Falcon Space. So they, they were the people who were looking at it. They had the sample. So yeah. it's just how you build things. It's it's how you see it and how you know to build it, right? Because most people don't know you grow a crystal. They don't know you could buy it at the store and grow it in your microwave. They don't they don't understand how you can take statics and put it into a microwave, you know what I mean? And yeah, so no, I do. I you know, I'm seeing some of the comments and, and whatnot. Uh you know, I don't know when they came in, um, it, but it, it ties it ties right on it. So, um, boss is saying sodium silicates. Um, you know, uh, Charles uh, Milligan is saying uh, cast stone. Um, well, you know, to kind of backtrack to where we started this conversation with this yeah, mineral specimen, it. right? Um, I shared what off the top of my head was the chemical compound. Please don't quote me on it one hundred percent, but the chemical compound uh, that I believe it to be was. Um, uh, zinc, copper, hydroxide, chloride. Okay, that was, um, that's what that was. Um, and uh, it could also have um, magnesium uh, in the mix, depending on the sample. Um, you know, obviously, if you're lab creating the stuff, <laughs> the sample doesn't matter. It's in there if you put it, right? So yeah. um, uh, that that was what we, like, I, I could tell you, this is causing the effects all in one that we're kind of talking about. You know, um, one crystal that I find interesting and always have, uh, although its properties are not um, really tangible in, in terms of, you know, experimentation, I, I suppose, is sapphire. You know, uh, corundum in itself is a astounding material it's incredibly um strong and it's um it's got a hexagonal um crystalline structure which is probably ideal you know when you're yeah. talking about transmission of um you know those types of energies um you know you mix that with its hardness its uh resilience and its ability to be readily um lab grown you know 
in your microwave, you can make rubies and sapphires in your microwave. Yeah, I've seen that. Um, and mind you, um, what, what the compound is, is pure aluminum oxide at its core. Really? You know? So sapphire, ruby, corundum as a whole is um, crystallized, you know, aluminum uh, oxide. Um, oh, cool. And it's um, second, uh, you know, hardness only to diamond. And again, you can make it in your microwave. And in fact, it's a little show and tell. Give me one second. I want to show yeah, you something I found. <laughs> so here's a uh, massive sapphire that I found. Massive. Okay. I'm not saying it's like a jewelry sapphire. It's not, you know, there might be little parts in it that, you know, make something pretty nice. Of, let's see. It's blue because it has an iron content. Nice. You know, but what's interesting did, about did it, it always, is its structure. Sorry, did it come out that glossy when you pulled it out? I, I gave it a little elbow grease, but it was pretty close. The, actually, it's it's funny um, how I came about this because. See, I live on I live on Long Island. Um, we don't have any we don't live we don't have any geology here at all. Like it's all um beaches, you know. We live on a sandbar, basically. Yeah. Um, but the way that Long Island was formed, you know, was through gla glacial activity. You know, the glaciers came down from the north, ripped every mountain top off, you know, and froze it right into the ice as it traveled along south, south, south. And it stopped in Long Island, you know, uh, which basically was what shoved all of the uh, the sand and whatnot to create it. Um, and when they started to recede, all of whatever it picked up from as far north as the, you know the North Pole, for crying out loud, you know, is basically here. So we, even though we don't have any geology, we have very interesting, random. Um, glacial erratics and stuff like big boulders that'll just be in the middle of nowhere <laughs> with no mountain because it's like well the glacier dropped it there along with that is what they call glacial till it's all the the ground up minerals crystals this that that just got basically pulverized and left here so i was in a river that was right um next to uh, the uh, house i was living in and it's like a little stream I would just go down in the stream and, you know, dig around and, you know, pull rocks out of there and shit. And I noticed that there was a huge corundum deposit that must have, you know, probably got pulled out from uh, Vermont or Connecticut or something like that. Or even further north could have been Canada. Yeah. And then got left here. So, um, you know, I saw uh, this rock in, in this stream and it was covered in moss and everything, but I immediately knew. It was something good. What it was at the time, I didn't really know. It was something. Yeah. But then, but then I, I washed it off, and I almost immediately knew what it was. And then I took a quartz crystal, and I'm sitting there, you know, working. I'm like, yo, this is destroying the quartz crystal. This thing's good as new. So, I mean, I, I did take a little, uh, you know, sandpaper and polish to it. But this okay. is more or less, it, it was pretty darn shiny and stuff coming out. Nice. Yeah. But... You know, it's the the reason I'm showing and telling is, I mean, I I would be, like to better understand some of the, um, you know, physical properties of, um, you know, the corundum material uh, in context of this, because I know that its crystal structure is suitable for this. I know that its hardness is unsurpassed for this, unless if you're using diamonds, there's nothing tougher, harder. It's uh, the only thing tougher than it is jade. Mm -hmm. You know, jade's not harder than it, but it's tougher than. It. But this this is a suitable material. The only downfall of it is that it is very heavy. Yeah. The good thing is is that it grows in layers, and you could grow basically a single layer potentially, or or utilize it in that fashion, or you know, I realistically the the material science of how they use it currently, they use it for lasers. Huh. You know, they make um, artificial rubies, um, lab-grown rubies. They cut them into cylinders, They and then they 
you know, discharge through the ruby and that uh, makes a coherent light source. It's, it's this ability to dope it and make it hard, you know, material that, um, you know, has the ability to make something coherent, you know, which that's the part of it that I'm interested in is that is the coherence and that's the crystal structure of it. It's yeah. Because it's a, it's a hexagon. That's so awesome. I, yeah. I, I'm not an expert on this by any means. I just know the testing that I've done. I, I usually deal with the voltages and stuff like that. This is something that uh, right now uh, Bernie would love. This, yeah. this, this is something uh, you ever watch his show. Uh, yeah, I've, I've caught like little bits and pieces, but really I, I kind of more dedicated uh, to this recently. So I'm still getting oh. my feet a little wet. His yeah. uh, He's breaking down all the mi mi minerals. So, you know what I mean? Uh, he's taking whatever it is, silver, uh, copper, anything, and he's breaking it down to a base min mineral. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. at, at the bottom of his jar, he's just using uh, electrolysis in order to get them broken down. That's why I think it's so fascinating. Because it falls yeah. right in there. Build, you know, Break down everything, build it back up the way you want it. Re restructure it. And 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 that's kind of why I disclaimed right at the beginning of this. I'm like I'm I'm a little jack of all and master of none, um, but you know connecting the dots of the seemingly unrelated yeah. is is it. It's why the it's why everything isn't done, you know. And society has a massive problem with that. And uh, I think oh, yeah. it's just systemic. I think it's on purpose, personally. But you know. You have well we have to ask the expert and the experts so tied up in being an expert that when somebody else comes and says hey but i know something else and you know here it is analogous you know this relates to this like this relates to that but it's dismissed because well you're not the expert on it and that has nothing to do with this and i don't know enough about that to see what you're saying you know, and that's what dabbling in all the different pieces and understanding just enough, you know, uh, about it that says, hey, you know, like, what's the workaround on this? Or how could this be relevant to that? Maybe it is, maybe it's not, you know, it's, uh, I don't know. I don't know shit, man, <laughs> you know, but, it, you know, it, the fun in it is trying to say, hey, look, you know, maybe what makes a laser coherent you know, can also add functionality to this, to, to this aspect of it, because we know the interactions between uh, electrical fields and crystals. Yeah. We know the, we know the relationship between, you know, um, resonance and frequency in crystals. And now on the optical aspect of things, we know that it could make um, photons coherent. And all in all one wavelength, you know, yeah, and you, you know, all of the um, devices that you use to be able to control frequency and stuff, they run off of the crystals, you know, so we know that that has what to do with it. But now how does it how does it play into or does it not play into this system too? what attribute can it add? Is that what takes this from hovering off the ground? to breaking space time yeah i i think this you know? is more of a kind of a warp drive tech when but i gotta be honest i don't i don't see the out. difference i mean maybe to, again i'm i'm a one to learn but i don't see the difference you see when you talk about sucking power out of the vacuum mm -hmm. you know when you talk about having something hover off the ground you talk about slowing down time or speeding up time, you know, or being here or there. Frankly, I think that once the barrier is broken, I think it's all the same technology. Oh, um, I, I, I got think, for you. Go ahead. Yeah, I think it's all the same technology because they're by virtue of defeating the gravity. Okay the fabric is then broken you know it's like if i were to cut a hole in this t-shirt you know even if it was only like a like a couple of threads 
you know, it's those threads that hold the rest of it together. This this will not be held together, you know, um, just by virtue of the rest, because that one hole is going to spread. You know, it it's like by breaking the gravity barrier. You know, you just screwed up time. Yeah. You know, once you screw up time, you just screwed up space. You know, and that's what I was talking about with, with science and how they look at things. They run all these tests and they try to say, use all these sensors to sense something that they can't sense because they're not looking in the right place or for the right thing. Because we, we don't exist in the third dimension. You know, this mouse is a three is three dimensional, you know, but guess what? It, it exists somewhere. You know, it, the fourth dimension is where this mouse exists amongst all the other things in that environment, you know? Right. So what we experience is not the third dimension, in my opinion. We, we experience the fourth dimension, you know, and I am under the personal belief in my own meditations and considerations that, you know, existence as a whole works off of multidimensionality and that the porous is driven like like a conveyor belt by something that it is a part of the force is acting to create these vortices okay is actually outside of that so right. where i'm going with this is when you're when they're trying to detect different things and make all these studies and conclusions they're looking in fourth dimensional space which they're calling three dimensional, but they're they're looking in fourth dimensional space. They need to they need to take these equations, and they need to make them into higher dimensional space, fourth and fifth dimensional space, in order for the equations to actually be what they are, and to know where to look because where to look is not here; it's there. But where is there? There right. is beyond the barrier that is trying to be broken right here. Right. You know. Because once you're not stuck to the planet and it can move here and there, it could also be then and now and, you know, because it's all part of the same system. That's the bigger system. Yeah. The gravity is, and Einstein said that, and I mean, I think that his work is getting, you know, it was good to build the block, to, to, to put rhyme to the reason, but at the end of the day, it's... And, it's the most simplified version and it's only from the perspective of 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 this fourth dimensional reality of time space that we exist in you know right. that's it once you break the gravity barrier the time and space barrier is i think innately broken too um or not far off and on by the same means but i don't I, know that you could break the gravity barrier without breaking the time space barrier well, it's funny that you say that. I was going to show you this picture. Now, just just let me present it real quick, and I'll, I'll show it to you, okay? I was trying to show it, and I wish I had my other one where I drew on it, okay? But this right here, okay? If you follow my cursor right inside this bubble, right in here, this little cavernous area right here, it's a time dilation field. Mm -hmm it right there changes the time. The field that's closest to the outside changes your dimension. So with the frequency of stuff of the field, you're getting time dilation on the inside. It'll always change the time on the inside versus the outside of the entire thing. Remember, we're talking about the mirror. You could put your hand through it, okay? And you'd be on a different side of the field, right? We're talking static electricity in the field. When you put your hand in, it's one field. When you put your hand out, it's different, right? The frequencies are completely different. It's the same thing here. Inside is time dilation. The outside of it right there is the field. So as you cross the field into the time dilation, you would have to be inside closest to the vortex. Yeah. Does that make sense? It absolutely does. I mean, look, this stuff all ties into my own personal beliefs in the universe and how everything's spreading apart. Well, yeah, I mean, if you look at the outside of a torus, you know, everything's spreading apart until it's not. And that's the point that you can't see past. 
you know, and once you get to that point, everything starts to consolidate again until it's consolidated to an ultimate uh, singularity once again in, in the middle. As above, so below. You know, it's the, you know, what, what you create here is what we are actually, you know, is the, the micro version of the macro. Um, yeah. You know, and uh, we could uh, have observable, you know, uh, instances of this on the even more micro level you know uh which, which is much simpler to do it's always easier to do on a smaller scale than a larger scale scaling things up tends to be a real son of a bitch um did but, you hear gerald's story on what happened to his coil with his no. kid he's no. sitting in his room he's sitting in this his uh area right oh wait i did hear this where he disappeared yes yeah you know man like uh, I, again, I, I have spiritual elements in myself, you know, like I am I deep into meditative practices. Um, you know, I'm a firm believer of binaural beats and uh, hemispherical, uh, hemispherical synchronization. Um, yeah, and, and I could tell you, like, you know, there's ways to break the break the mold and break the system in here. There is, you know, like it's it's all well within the human capability um you know and using that to your benefit by the way is much easier said than done you're still a human being at the end of the day yeah. you know uh, being being able to apply this um especially in a world filled with people that um are not on this wavelength you know whether it's this or that or the next thing you know it's um it's a very uh complicated um you know thing that you have to <laughs> tool set at best, you know, you got to spin on the spiral and still be a human, you know, yeah. and, and that's, that's really what it boils down to. Um, you know, like when this, when, when your UFO flies about and I know it will, <laughs> trust me, this community will make sure oh, it well. does. It, you'll make sure it does. And this community will support that. And, you know, understand that. Um, that said, if you show it to just the, the any random guy, good luck. Good luck. Because even even seeing is not believing because perspective, you know, and that's that's uh major, you know. Um I don't know. It's uh, it's it's gonna be a tough sell, I think, um, to the general, you know, person out there. Well, I, I see it like this. If you get it out there, right? And you show it and you have all your ducks in, in a row and you got it all right. Someone's going to come along that understands it and they'll build it again. Okay. And build it again. And the knowledge will be passed on. There's always going to be people who just want to live in a little world that they can understand. Okay. Where everything's just always right. And it's like a sim universe. And that's where they want to live. Okay. Which is fine. I just like you don't choose to lose, live there. I want to live on the outside. That's why we call it the fringe think tank because we're completely different than everyone else. We, yeah, just it's the we just see this world differently and we want to take advantage of it. You know what I mean? My, my biggest thing is I want to see the solar system. That's it. You know what I mean? And it may never happen, but that's exactly what I want out of all of this. And then I'm done. I go sit there in my little chair and have my sip of tea and be done. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just, that's a goal. That's yeah. Just you know, I mean, th this is just a personal, uh, you know, level commentary on that. Cause you know, like, uh, you, I, if you believe you're going to do that, then, you know, I believe that you're going to too. Cause you know, it's that will, it's that will to succeed. That'll always make it happen. And even if it doesn't, if you've made the progress in your lifetime toward it, where like, you know, that you've made a meaningful contribution. I mean, sometimes that's, you know, sometimes it's the journey, you know, as much as anything else. Um, but you know, for what it's worth, as far as like, you know, actual exploration, um, non-physical exploration is a, is a very real thing too. By the way, I'm so, not that this matters and no judgment, but I've never done drugs in my entire life or anything like that. I don't even drink alcohol. Um, you know, so like anything that I experience is, you know, induced and also controlled within the reason of, well, not everybody can like, you know, appreciate 
um, some of the states of mind that you could reach within yourself, um, you know, without having experienced it. That's the difference between um, uh, believing something and knowing something, you know, is, is experiencing it, right? Yeah. Where I'm going with this, because I've used a whole bunch of words at this point, <laughs> to some aid nothing, um, is, you know, if, if you um, were to, you know, delve into like meditative practices, get deep into that and able to like achieve those, you'd be mind blown as to some of the um, experiences that you could have um, that would probably work toward a lot of this. Um because information comes out of very interesting places when you're deep within yourself, you know? Um, but aside from that, I don't know that the experience of that, once you reach a certain level would be much different than you actually buzzing around physically and exploring the solar system. Okay. Check this out. I got to share this with you. I do fasting. Okay. And not meditation, it's just fasting. It's a form. I, it's a form of meditation. Yeah. I'll go several days without eating. Okay. And once you get past the hunger part of it, your mind changes. You no longer are using your energy for digestion. You're using it in your mind, right? So where most people's minds wander or something like that, mine's focused on one thing. I can see something very clearly. I can see how it's put together. I can see the individual parts of it. I could see how it's broken down. I could take every experience I had and build it into it immediately without question. I could, I walk around for a mile, right? Every day on a track, you know, at, at, at my local park. And that's all I do. Okay. Is I put the pieces together. Then I come back and I start building the pieces. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's the way it works. It, it clears your mind of the garbage. Okay. And it'll tell you which part interacted with which part, which part didn't interact well, but will interact again if you put it in this sequence, right? That's all that happened. And my mind can put it all together. That's what I do for meditation is just fast, walk, yeah. find out. Well, it's a, it's a very ancient way of meditation, you know. Um, and, and societies all throughout time have, you know, taken to times of, uh, you know, intentful fasting it's always different when you make the choice to fast as opposed to starving yes. you know because uh the the psychology of it is um extremely different you know when you're starving you're worried you're looking yeah. for something to eat when you make a you know cognizant choice to um stop eating to enter into these states you will enter into those states and it, 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 it's um you know healthy therapeutic and um also a very profound form of meditation um but you know like it, it's something in my opinion you know like if you were to explore with that you know you might be very impressed with um how, how you how you never had to turn a screwdriver to you know physically get up and fly around when you know you could reach mental states that allow you to do that and i i think that the science is a very supporting of that these days you know i think that um you know even accepted science uh that you know might might be fringe to me at this point you know i think that a lot of the the accepted sciences are fringe not what we're thinking you know well Probably they were um, normal in about the 1900s when they didn't know any better, but now that we're getting to know better, they they're becoming obsolete. Well, right. Well, I I think that the old saying is at this point, like you know, the old science, you know, they clicked the two stones together and got it to blow up. You know, we clicked the two stones together to get get it to suck in. Um, you know, implosion always being the creative force and. Um, you know, uh, Malcolm Bendel definitely had, uh, you know, found that in his um, thunderstorm generator. And I think he was on to great things. Um, like I <laughs> said to you when we were talking before about the, the twin uh, turbochargers 69ing each other, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a great concept, you know? Um, yeah. But, no, it's uh, it, it's it's just such um fascinating topics um, and and just how it all ties into each other. Being to me the most incredible aspect of it between the mental, the crystal, 
the, the you know the uh, the fields and the effects because at the end of the day we are all these fields that's my belief at least you know we are all these fields and it is all these fields and you know the well the, the accepted science now is that there well matter doesn't even exist there is no such thing as solid matter well yeah okay we get that it's all fields yeah, you know so um holographic reality you know and um it, it's um it's once you realize that everything is a holographic reality and you realize that what are these holograms that's the next question right because once you know what the hologram is well then now you beat the hologram you know um and you can manipulate it any which way and up down left right speed of light and beyond past present future it's it's all attainable and it's all the same yeah i just see and, it a little differently it, it, i see it like this we're inside the box right now, right? And that's the way we're thinking. The cube. Yeah, we're pushing on the little box, okay? When you get smart enough, you can stand outside the box and watch the people in the box, right? And then at some point, you just take the box and throw it away mm -hmm. because you're way beyond it. Yeah, yeah, life here is walking walking the line in chains. I don't believe in that mantra. So, um, yeah, it's... But that ties in again. It's an esoteric teaching, you know, the, the the black cube of Saturn, you know, all these religions worshiping the black cube. You know, we're in the black cube. Yeah. Or, you know, some of us may be more than others. You know, but, um, <laughs> you know, that's that's really kind of what it boils down to. You know, um, is that is is exactly that inside the box breaking outside of the box and. Again, it's, it's that little tear in the T-shirt. Once you once you can see what's in the box, it's like, well, is there a box anymore? That's that's the thing. I don't but, think there is. I think that once there's a hole in the box, there's no box anymore. So what's going on in the center of that coil where you're sticking your iron pins and, you know, that sort of stuff? Is that the same thing that, you know, a lot? It doesn't like it exist now then and then you know forward back and now like does it exist in all those times like at that point like there's countless examples of those ring rings of fire over tennessee the tennessee portals and shit like that yeah i, I can tell you, you that know? if i ever get the chance and i probably will i get in a room with gerald we'll start up his coil i want to see we'll put cameras around the outside of the room right I want to see the time dilation, and then I want to reverse the field, and I want to see if it goes backwards, because it may slow things down, right? And I want to see how much it could slow it down, but then I want to see if it'll fast forward. You know what I mean? I want yeah. to know the opposite. If it can do both, you got, you know, that just blow my mind right there, because then it gives you, then your reality is broken. In your mind, it's broken. You may have already been there, but it's totally broken now. It's it things don't exist the way they they should. You know what I mean? The way the structure tells us they do now would be completely gone. Yeah. Well, you got to remember one thing too, and it's this is the one thing that I think with Einstein will stand the test of time is the the concept of relativity, perspective. You know, things are as measurable as the place time you know of measurement you know and what that leads to is um a bit of a conundrum of objectivity versus subjectivity you know what could be measured one time by one person will not be repeatable even if done the same way which is the scientific method you know um and if i were to observe like when i was clicking those rocks together i'm like did you did you see that and it's like uh -huh. what i experienced in this field might be different than what was experienced by somebody else right outside that field simply because i'm subject to the phenomena while they are not right you know like to me something could have and i'm not saying this did or didn't happen you know but like when I was rubbing those two rocks together and the thing literally was sitting flat and then flipped itself over and then decided to lock onto the thing like it had a 50-pound weight on top of it, 
maybe that's because time slowed down so much that what would usually just be a fluid action did not appear fluid whatsoever. And what was actually locking is the fact that time is standing still. And in that moment, it's fixed. Yeah. So that might be a time dilation phenomena as opposed to any of the other stuff, but it's all the other stuff. And that's the point I'm trying to bring to light here with it, with what I'm saying is it's all the same, you know, Oh, well, it's because of the field. Well, the field did this. Well, the field did that. Well, yeah, but if time dilation, see, with speed, they say, well, you can't, you know, you can't go faster than the speed of light. Biggest line of horse shit ever. Um, Benatov actually, Benatov actually said that the best, you know, I, I think with how he drew his little graphs and shit and in a very comical fashion is really relatable to how I do my work. <laughs> like stick figures <laughs> i'm an artist and i draw stick figures yeah. is it uh, where i'm going with that is it's like if you slow down time and your time is subjectively slower then you could cover more distance over that same amount of time you know without light being a factor at all yeah. and that's where it gets screwy and that's where it's like well okay well this is you know, shooting up at an inconceivable speed. This, these UAPs that they see on their sensors, gone. No, he might have been doing 40 miles an hour at, you know, one one hundredth of a second frame rate, so to speak, if you want to, like, I don't have a better way of describing, like, like what we, what we see as what happened instantly, subjectively within that craft may have actually been at a leisurely pace <laughs> you yeah. know like which is why there's no effects of the body because you know they're, they're inertia. In that time dilation field where you're in a time not. dilation field exactly so it's like well you're going 60 miles an hour at a regular rate of acceleration as far as you're subjectively concerned but once you're standing outside that 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 field well, all of a sudden, it's like, holy shit, you see that thing go? Where'd it go? It's gone. It disappeared. No, well, you know, but exactly. what does that mean for the human on board that vessel, though? This, you know, like, yeah, he's not feeling the inertia of it at all. Not feeling the inertia, not aging, because I mean, time, time in reality is going real slow, but here you are in suspended. That's animation right. you, you know you're almost suspended animation that's great. Is that how it works or is it the opposite i don't know or are you aging ridiculously fast when you travel ridiculously fast well, they say the opposite but is it wouldn't the inverse be true if you're the one experiencing it and then the outside appears that you're going very fast because the perspective is always from the outside and never seen from the inside i got it the inverse yeah it's not yeah so so oh well you go really fast you get younger oh well, yeah or you go really fast and you get older yeah <laughs> uh. <laughs> totally <laughs> well, what, what i love about when they talk about that uh, special field of relativity they always talk about the train moving and that you're standing mm -hmm. there right and your perspective on it's different well, what what if you just understand it as energy that mm -hmm. energy is moving and you're not that that's the whole thing everything around you is energy and as the energy moves if you're standing still it's moving without you you know what i mean it's in a different field of its own and if you can understand it that way time dilation is not that hard not at all and that's why the that's why i said i think that one thing that einstein's you know is that subjective relativity not necessarily relativity as a whole but the subjective relativity aspect of it right I think that'll stand the test of time because I mean, real for, for from our living perspective, you know, all we all we have is the subjective reality. So um, you know, if if that's the way of it, then that's uh, that's it. You you're never gonna be able to repeat the experiments, you know, to to an outside individual without them being inside. Yes, you know. So uh, the the amount of people that um, have these experiences, so whatever they just written off as, you know, 
head case or or fringe or you know whatever show it in show it in math it's like well yeah it, here's the thing is it it fell off the math chart because it you know, once once you stop time now that no longer now your equations that you're held is absolutely true they no longer work because you're working in a different dimension which is exactly what i was saying you know well so, that that's what i always say don't try to define it with math until you understand what it is and mm -hmm. far too often they define things with math and try to build it well you're building a closed universe i don't want to build that i want to build an open one okay and in order to do that I must build it before I define it. So what I always do is every time I see something, I have to build it. I need to verify that it's there. I need to verify structures of it. That's kind of one of the most important things. That's why we do this thing with everybody in the French think tank, man. We always come back to building it, verify it, see that it works, build the next level. That way, everybody else can share the adventure with us. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. That, that, and everybody's got different skill sets and experiences of their own to add into it. And, um, you know, that's where academia is totally poisoned, you know, is yeah. you, you um, read your textbooks, you learn the laws, you have to stick to those laws in order to come to your conclusions. And if you fall outside the lines, if it's, if it's this much, okay, you know, corrections can be made, you know, new understanding can be built. Once you say, well, this framework is shit you know here's the new framework look at uh what's his name um uh the guy that was on rogan uh anyway the guy with the unified theory that he says he came yeah. up with it himself and i li literally like you know i i was like yo terrence howard. somebody terrence howard yeah, somebody should spit in your face because you came up with none of this, man. You're a thief, <laughs> you know, and it could have came to you in a dream and you could have came up with it, but you used everybody else's work and said, you're the one that tied it together. But yet I've heard other people say the same stuff. They're just not you, you know, and say it before you and they're just not you. And you're not part of any community like that. You just want to, you know, put a name out there for yourself, you know, whatever. That, that guy, he turned me off even, even when he was like right he just was very unrelatable to the general population of people so therefore he was you know labeled and maimed and basically discredited anything that he was bringing to the table which a lot of it was correct you know um it, it's just tough because academia is made that way um and the people that they train are mathematicians or physicists and they want equations and when they come up with something and they come up with some type of idea to try and test for something new, that's always what they're into, testing for something new. They're not building these fucking machines. They don't understand how, they might understand like what they're trying to achieve, but the actual engineering aspects of it, you know, like, I don't know that that's their specialty. They have to, you know, pull from the outside. They don't have enough knowledge outside of their own little bubble to really know how that other element of it works, to know how it could work for them, to like, and that's why I said a little bit of jack of all goes a long way. Analogy goes a long way. Being able to understand how one thing seemingly unrelated to another connects with the other, that's putting the pieces together. And they're totally against this. Yeah. You know, totally against it. And I think it's humorous because you spend billions of dollars in funding, trillions of dollars in funding to basically, I don't want to, you know, look, not all of them are fools, but a lot of them are, you know, fools. And, and and they're they're sitting there dumping all this money into research for shit that they've known for the last 75 years they have the technologies already and the whole idea behind funding it is you know, keep on trying to find it try to find it this way here's your check keep keep the cash cow come keep them off the target keep them off the target you know you think lockheed martin doesn't know how to do this shit give me a break give me like come on <laughs> you know <laughs> right Right, you you, th you think Ray Raytheon, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like doesn't doesn't know how to. Oh, dude, look, you know? <laughs> there's experiments out there that are getting like millions and millions of dollars put into them, and I can do the same experiment in my garage for about ten bucks, and it would be better quality. It would be better quality because you don't have the chains. 
That's what yeah. I said before. Walking the line in chains, you know, like they they want you to do something, but you have to do it this certain way. And the reason it's got to be that way is because they know you'll never you'll never find what they're setting out to find the way that the, the way that they instruct. Yeah. And and the system is is made to disprove and outcast anybody that actually does stumble upon it. Yeah, well, I can tell you right now, if I just wrote down my theory on high voltage and how it works with frequency and heat and everything like that, it would completely change all their mathematics altogether because they wouldn't be able to define everything in watts because watts lie to you. You know what I mean? And yeah. I can, it would completely change all of it. They would have to develop new math just to figure it out. Well, you know, when you when you're sucking power from a vacuum, which it's not even, you know, when you're taking power from the zero point, that breaks entropy. You know, that's what so, Gerald keeps saying to me. He keeps so when, saying the same so thing when you right, right, and 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 rule number one of being a physicist is. You can break any rule you want as long as you don't break the rule rule of thermodynamics. Yeah, and a long time ago. And the, why is that rule in place? Well, because they figured out how to break the rule of thermodynamics. Right. <laughs> there, ha there has <laughs> to be a law in order to outlaw what you're doing. Right, right. The fastest way to be shut down in the scientific community is to say that you've found perpetual energy. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, oh no, no, oh, look, it's not here. No, it is, <laughs> and then it, and then it gets used, and then there's more. <laughs> you know, like they're like, well, no, that that can't. I mean, what I've never heard talked about is the potential adverse effect of just um because thermodynamics is a real thing in the third dimensional space in which we're we exist, right, or fourth dimensional space in which we exist. Thermodynamics is is a thing. Well, you break that, and then all of a sudden you have it. Now, now that you have it, right? What does it mean when you start pumping energy into a system that is dissipating it? We don't know how, really, because it doesn't dissipate; it doesn't go away. So now you're tipping the scales from um, uh, predictable, you know, um, incoherence to perpetual coherence to incoherence where like at what point does, does it does the system get overloaded at some point where it's like where does all this energy have to go it's been dissipated as heat now so where's all this heat going like i think that's something nobody's talking about but why talk about the result of something that you haven't found yet that's like when they discovered that fossil fuels would burn nice and effectively for purposes of you know internal combustion and then saying well what about all the the bullshit that's going to happen down the line with that no well, nobody was having that conversation then nobody cared because it was it was a new thing yeah well like the vortex explains the heat of the equator perfectly if you really understand it then you see that there's a north and a south pole that the energy flows inside there, right? Just like we were talking about like this, but the outside ring is hot. That's the thing. The outside ring is hot. It's ice cold in the center and it flows. The, it, it explains it perfectly. And it, that, that to me, so it, like I, it explains it perfectly, but that like, I guess when you hit, hit that certain level of thinking, that to me sounds like common sense stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, yeah, it, you know, it's, it's just the way it's the way it is, <laughs> you know, it's, it's gotta be hot coming out one side and cold coming in the other, just like it's gotta be light coming out one side and dark on the other. It, 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 you, it, you have to have the duality, you know, yeah. once, when you realize that everything is a duality and that the, the solution is always, um, the, the coherent middle ground. You know, and when you're talking about coils and things of that nature, when you're, uh, you know, talking about, you know, um, like dual inductors, you know, um, creating, you know, a dual porous, uh, putting out slightly different frequencies, you know, each having their own frequency of that field in onto themselves and then having the offset plus or minus 
as the um, amalgamation of those two fields, you know, and then you're dealing with, um, and you think about Tesla and you think about the modulation of that on the plus and minus output scale, you know, if you modulate these things to inverse with one okay, another. Hold, hold on. Let me, let me break your train of thought for a second. Sure. Building a Tesla coil. When you put the outside at 300, right? 300 kilohertz. The inside at 300 kilohertz. Your resonance frequency is 240 kilohertz. Why? The inside and outside may have the same quality, right? And that's what they're built for. But the actual resonance frequency is different. Just like what you just, you just said it. And that's why. And that, that's why. So where does it go, right? It's not spent. Um, and and that tends to be the question. So now, when, if you modulate it, plus and minus, you could have different offsets shifting. You know, yeah. like that's that is the that is it. <laughs> you know, but that's it on every level. Like that's it if you're trying to make something float. It's it if you're trying to slow down time or speed it up. It's all about that modulation between yeah. the two. The difference, it's the difference in which is the creation. You know, it's not the one or the other. It's what's in the, what they create together. Yes. So. That's it. Yeah. It changes you know, your whole perspective on things because, like I said, when I say you throw away the box, right? Uh, and I always give this example. If I take an AC flyback, right? I take a Tesla coil. You tell me they're all different. You tell me this one's built on AC. But this one over here is built on DC, right? But then when I have my buddy Sean build it, he built a Tesla coil that's wound. You know what I mean? Each layer, each layer, each layer. It is an AC flyback in a Tesla coil form. And it operates like a Tesla coil. And it's yet to be, you know what I mean, what they tell me it is. The funny thing is, the only thing coming out of it is potential. Okay. It is it is no longer AC and DC, no matter what you put into it. It's only potential. Well, out. That, that potential is the zero point, you yeah. know? Um, I, I don't know. I, I kind of, I, I really think that um, big picture stuff, you know, I, I really think that, um, you know, we're all static interference of like all reality is static interference of the zero point. Um, you know, in my own meditations and such, you know, when I've, uh, tried to visualize, um, creation, you know, you tie Bible into it, you tie, uh, you know, physics and then the stuff we're discussing. If you think about it, you know, if you have a sign, you know, uh, the longest like ELF type sine wave, it's flat, it's totally undisturbed its potential well let's take back what we said a second ago about the two coils interacting with one another right you have this one god frequency of potential what happens if you have another god frequency of potential and then they interact well you have static at that point that interaction is it would, would be static you know and any difference between the two would be oscillation and disturbance. And it's through that disturbance of the static created between the two, okay, that is the creation of matter. You know, I know that that's, it's so far off a of base of what we were talking no, about. But but see how things are one and another. It's all the same. It's all the same. The two coils, the difference, the the zero point it, it's all the same creation of this universe and for all i know i'm totally wrong probably i don't know i'm not you know I, i'm an idiot with a high school diploma man you know <laughs> like uh, and uh, who likes to think and talk you know yeah. and uh it's like you know one of these things where if you think about it, it it makes sense. You think about the life and death, soul and mind, and all these other things. And it's like, well, 
somebody said at one time, it was very, it was really profound in my life. And I forget who it was. It was years and years and years ago. He said, you think that there's, this is all there is, you know, close your eyes, say to yourself, apple and visualize it. You heard yourself say the word apple and you saw an apple. Where was that? Yeah. Where is that, that you see with your eyes closed, you hear without making a sound, where does that exist, right? Well, it exists somewhere. Well, people will tell you it's in your head. Well, okay, so where where did this Come exist? Where yeah. did the sensory input inside your mush skull come from? <laughs> uh, you know, the answer is the same. It's these fields interacting with each other and creating it, manifesting it in a mental sense somewhere where it doesn't even have to be here because isn't that the nature of all what we're talking about? It's not here or there or now and then it's that it just is, Yeah, you know? So uh, he said, uh, so you could see, he's like, we know up, down, we know left, right. We know forward, back. He's like, what about in and out? And isn't that what we're talking about? in and out isn't that what a torus is isn't that what a spiral is isn't that it's all in and out you know and when you're thinking about creation both mental and physical and you talk about there was nothing and then there was something well that's how two interaction creation everything's got to follow that formula yep you call it one, two, three, call it three, six, nine, you call know, anything you want, it, call it whatever you want. There. But uh, on top of that, plus and minus positive what, and negative. What I think is funny is people just don't understand. Like you can even take this into your gardening. So if you understand the concept of the vortex and the energy and how things grow, all you have to do is create a mini vortex or a magnetic field around something that is not harmful and things grow faster. That's it. It's as simple as that. And, and a lot of people do it. If you just simply take a ceramic magnet and put it in the ground, put your seed in it, it grows four times as fast. You want to take a rod and coil, put it on top, put a seed in the center, it'll grow four times as fast. You're creating that same field. Okay. You take Gerald's coil, put it there, put the seed in the center, let it grow four times as fast. Why? Because it's getting more of the energy that it likes. It's getting that earth energy. It's getting that ether. It's getting what it wants. Okay? It no longer has to work as hard for it. So, in return, it grows twice as much. Or four times as much. You get what I'm yeah. saying? Absolutely. It, 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 it's the whole premise of it. So, if we're in a ship, we would have to know that so that we can put it close to the center. Put it close to the ether. So, it grows faster so that we can, you know what I mean, consume it and eat it and you know what I mean? Create the cycle again. Yeah. Yeah, for, for sure. And, you know, it's uh, it all boils down to, um, you know, if you could understand the fundamentals of what you're trying to achieve, you know, I, I really think that, that that crosses bounds in all aspects of, of life, society, um, you know, uh, ways of thinking and um, just science in general. I think it's. I, I think that that's the key to, um, you know, having having. A, I mean, I hate words like words that people attribute to things because a unified theory, you know, like. But I, I really think that that's what it is. You know, at the end of the day, it's it's two opposites, um, and one creation, and. Um, you know, that's that, you know, if you could unlock uh, how to make something float, I think the rest of it just falls in line with it. I don't know how much you want to go back and, you know, hear upon your former self, but, you know, I you probably know, I, have. <laughs> I would say you cannot create one without inherently creating all the rest. It just doesn't that? work. That's it. Yeah. Like, um, did, did anybody have any questions for, for me about like my mineral experiences or anything like that? You know, that, um, you know, just in case. You know what? Just go over what happened just in, in, in a brief sense because I think most of the people got here a little later. That's okay. So um, what, what happened in, in a brief sense was I had uh, discovered um, in my travels 
um, a mineral specimen that I intended on making a piece of jewelry out of. Um, in cutting it apart, drilling out cores and stuff of this uh, mineral sample, I had noticed that it was acting um, unusually, as I like to put it. And the unusual um, attributes that it had was, um, uh, you know, seemingly that it was, um, you know, it had like locking abilities where it was like locking with other pieces of itself and other um, non-reactive, um, you know, the types of material. Um, I had uh, situations where it was putting out large static fields. Uh, also, um, you know, uh, creating some type of EMF, you know, disturbance uh in in its immediate area it had physical um effects on me as well personally um and just overall this this particular mineral um it really had a extraordinary yet subtle um effects you know on on its surrounding environment um you know seemingly uh in in its moments of excitement as scientifically they put it you know it has it had moments of excitement where it would become um uh, you know coherent in certain pole structures of it and that would emit um the vast as far as subjectively vast amounts of energy um you know in in the uh immediate area um you know when it would exhibit certain um properties like um you know magnetism um it, it would act as a dielectric sometimes uh, you know then other times it would um yeah i mean it, it, it was crazy shit. i don't really know man like the the amount of things that it did was silly and that that's what was silly about it is that i was like what what doesn't this do <laughs> you know it, it was putting out a charge and the charge was making magnetic fields it was making static fields it was as far as i could tell i i think it was probably dilating time to be honest i i think that that was an attribute of it um it was causing uh, me physical issues with you know the sensations in my fingers my hand locking up my, you know my legs locking up um metallic taste in my mouth which by the way i've had on and off <laughs> this whole time, the whole time. That little box. <laughs> yeah so that that's what i found um i believe it to be a, a mineral specimen of um magnesium containing hubert smithite um which is uh scientifically found to be a quantum spin liquid as they so named it um yeah it's just really fascinating so let's let's see uh they want to know if it's uranium no it, it was non-radioactive. Okay, so let's see. That was your. How about thorium? I originally thought that it might be thorium containing because the um the the rock that I had it in, um, was in a mountain range that is uh, you know thorium bearing, but uh it, again it was non-radioactive, so no, there was no thorium in it. Okay, uh, quartz as the crystalline form yeah so there there was uh crystal jersey quartz um you know basically crusting the outside of it um okay again to describe the uh to describe the specimen which i no longer have unfortunately i'm not going to go back into that but it, it was it, it again i noted some of the effects the effects had real world effects in my life so i said you know what it's got to go um but it, it um it had druzy quartz clusters perfectly formed crystals in certain pockets like on the side of the rock um it had layered flowing green um crystal you know um in layers and then uh the matrix around it was um it seemed seemed to be some type of um uh you know calcification like a limestone something very porous uh you know there were also pockets it's uh, almost similar to what you would expect from like um like a slag you know but like it wasn't it was much more formed crystalline formed than just a regular old piece of slag maybe it was slag frankly 
Somebody said yeah. Xenon. Yeah. Um, you got me there. Um, again, you know, the best, the best that I was able to find based on my hardness test, um, some of the acid tests, the specific gravity tests, um, you know, locality and then the subjective experiences that I've had with it, um, pointed it into the Hubert Smithite, um, you know, mineral categorization, at least for the green portion of it. Um, yeah, there was absolutely other inclusions. Like I said, it was uh, definitely from a, a quartz bearing scarn, like a scarn or two pieces of, um, you know, like a, you know, a mineral bearing, um, you know, mountain would rub up against each other, uh -huh. um, you know, and then over time metamorphosize under pressure and heat underground. Um, it definitely had an attribute of that, um, w which is, uh, you know, heavy quartz bearing. And in this case, it wasn't just um, vein quartz like you would expect in normal scar. It was also it was vein quartz uh, in addition to um, fully formed microcrystals, N not microcrystals like as in like chalcedony microcrystals, actual visible but very small Jersey quartz. Gotcha. Um, Fully was, there, was there any metals in it? Um, well, I mean, it, the chemical composition of it, like I like I had said, is metallic in nature. Um, it's uh, to the best that I could tell, it's zinc, copper, hydroxide, chloride, okay. with with magnesium. So yeah, and magnesium. I mean, you know, you think think about like um you know magnesium being able to hold the charge a piezoelectric being able to create a charge and then you have a quantum spin liquid you know that uh has magnetic poles and in electron spin that is undecided and fluctuating <laughs> you know like <laughs> and we wonder why the rock was fucked up <laughs> That's your own little power plant going on. <laughs> right, right. That, that's, what, that's what I told people. I was like, yo, there's nothing that this isn't. It's everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because you literally just said you had a battery in there, you have frequency in there, you have piezoelectric effect, you have a, a field that's moving continuously. <laughs> you have everything. And then it was cavernous. Yeah. <laughs> and it was cavernous on top of that. And I'm sitting there like, I had this thing around, and it was like either – the highest vibrational energy around this thing, or it was like life force sucking. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, like days would be months long and days would be flying by. And I'd be like, my legs ain't working. And my girlfriend's like, what the fuck are you doing, Joe? <laughs> you know? So, oh man. Yeah. Yeah. So it, that's the best that I could tell. I think some people are more susceptible to some of this than others. Some of oh, them absolutely. Yeah, they're just not. They're just not the same. So I mean, look, I got this little dumb right. coil right here, you know, with like a little piece of quartz stuck in it. It's nothing special, just some, you know. And okay. if I plug that in to a frequency, you know, uh, I mean, I could feel it. You know, like so you're activating the it. magnetic field inside the quartz with the uh, magnetic field you're putting around it. That one. So you know, and and because I have the tip of the quartz facing out, it's di directional, you know. By, by the way, that's what they do in planting with their stuff. They put in a rod, they swirl it, and they put quartz inside. They're hoping that the ether pulls in the energy and activates the quartz. You're actively activating the quartz. Well, this has a zero point itself because the way that this is, this right. is just, um, you know, there's a loop right there. <laughs> so... You know, I'm not. I'm not even asking the courts to suck in the zero point. Yeah, I'm creating the zero point and saying, "Here you go." <laughs> you know, that's right. Direct it. Uh, you know, I mean, I could hook this up to something with like, you know, no amplification whatsoever. Something simple like an electronic device. Hooked it up to my laptop, stuff like that. Put on a tone generator. You know, I mean, personally, I could, I could feel it. You know. Again, is that because I'm sensitive to it? I don't know. I could close my eyes, and if I go within a couple feet of it, whatever, it, I have it pointed at my head, okay? I could tell where on my head it is, you know? 
It's because you're actively activating the court. That's oh, what yeah. I try to explain to people. You have to turn it on. You won't feel anything until you turn it on. So if you just have it sitting on the counter, it does nothing. But you put that in that field and you're turning it on. That's the whole point. Well, they've been doing that since ancient times where they charge crystals, you know, and they have quartz bowls that are tuned to certain frequencies. You know, you could sit there and stroke the quartz, a quartz rod against the quartz bowl, crystal bowl. We all know crystal sings. You could sit there and lick your finger and go like that around a yeah. cheap wine glass and make the sound, right? So you do that to a certain specific tuned frequency with other quartz in its um, environment, eventually it synchronizes with it. And eventually, eventually, if you were to continue that for long enough, you would have sympathetic resonance throughout all of those crystals. Exactly. Now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> this, hey, well, like I said, I don't know this. shit. I just know what I think. I don't know. No, no, no. People don't understand this like this. They don't, they don't understand the resonance. You know what I mean? Get the same frequency. It has to match. It has to work the same. It has to be close to it in the beginning or else it won't do anything. It, you put a rock next to it, it won't do anything to the rock. Put the quartz next to it because of the crystalline structure, it'll start to do something with it. You know what I'm saying? Well, it's everything, like, everything, to my understanding, will do something eventually, provided that you're able to... See, not everything time. wants to sync up because some things just have their own vibration and unless if you meet that vibration, you know, that's where the amplitude comes in. You know, you shake anything hard enough, it'll start shaking at that frequency you know, eventually. No, I understand yeah. that. I'm, just, I'm saying, like, if you want to actively activate something near you, it's yeah. going to have to be something that has the same frequency in it. Right. And, and I know this from Tesla coils. I have some that are probably, I, I don't know, 20 to 30 kilohertz apart okay and they don't they don't activate each other but if i can put it within 10 kilohertz right or five kilohertz this thing will light up a whole nother part of the room mm -hmm. start one to the next to the next to the next and before you know it i have way too much energy in my room you know what i mean wow i do <laughs> i wish i didn't <laughs> yeah <be honest. laughs> yeah yeah, um, yeah, it's it, it's so interesting, you know. And like I said, it all ties together, you know. Like that little thing. If, if you're feeling a little down in the dumps and whatnot, and you know your your frequencies are a little screwed up, your your brain has magnetized it, you know. And you, I hate to say it, you put on something like that, you know, it will sync up with that magnetite. That's without a doubt. Like play a good frequency that generally works with your brain function to promote some type of, you know, uplifting effect. And psychologically, you know, it, it'll follow suit. Well, so check this out. I, I love hieroglyphics. You see an Egyptian hieroglyphic with a staff. They show an Aachen, which is the uh, Egyptian. An Ankh, yeah, yeah. So that's basically the resonance symbol. So if I took that staff and you understood that as resonance and i put it next to your head what happens then it changes the frequency in your head to match what you're doing and makes you feel better okay? i think that i think the tale was that those onks were keys portal keys well you know i i mean that's a tale i don't know where i know <laughs> like i said resonance could be a portal key but that they, they don't have to be a physical thing it's what it produces anytime you see them you always see them next to bees You'll see them next to Rees, okay? Or you'll see it next to the thing that looks like a Tesla coil. They right. all produce resonance. Bees love resonance. They're attracted to it. You put a tuning fork next to it, it produces resonance. You put a Tesla coil, it produces resonance. Everything ties into that as the resonance symbol. Well, nature, so nature has... Um nature has um already figured all this stuff out. Oh, I lost you again. Oh, there you go. sorry. Yeah, no. Nature has already figured all this stuff out. Like it, it I think um, you know, the scarab beetle, right? We know about their uh, e e uh, elets or whatever. Um, you know, those wing coverings and, and how they have their own um, you know, cavernous material effect. Um, 
you know, you right, the elytra, right? And then you look at the size of the bee and the size of the wings, and you just know that the weight of this insect is incapable of flight. <laughs> you know, right. with with wings and, and at the speed that they're going. That system relies on the cavernous material effect and the interaction of the elytra with the resonant frequency that's created by the beating of those wings. See, those wings aren't wings like a helicopter a propeller is or, or an airplane propeller is where it's moving turbulence of air for thrust. That's not what they're doing. See, they are buzzing and the buzz and the and the and the buzzing that they are creating is what's creating them to be in a field that they are generating that is interacting with the elytra which allows them to do things like fly fucking sideways or go 30 miles an hour when they shouldn't even be able to fly at all but yet here they are 30 miles an hour flying through the air like a fat school bus with like fingers sticking out the side i love like, that fat school know, bus. yeah that's what it is it's like right it's like it's like a school bus with the children with their arms out <laughs> saying let's fly you know what i mean and it's like yeah. it doesn't make sense but if those kids started beating their arms really really fast like you know maybe like you know, 150, 200 times per second to create that frequency. And then, you know, your school bus, well, aluminum might be okay, but you know, whatever, maybe, maybe something, you know, all in sync though. And mind you that the, their wings aren't going like this, you know, like this isn't a bird proposition. Their wings are creating different frequencies. What is it? It's the same. It's the offset. Here we are again. We're talking about the same thing, different thing. It's all the same thing. It's this I, offset of frequencies. I, that's the way I see it too. Not everybody <laughs> sees it that way. I you always, can't transition from one thing to the next and understand it the same way. You know, right? But that but that is the way. And um, you know, the the um Tibetan monks. <laughs> yeah. The big old horn. Uh, oh look! Hold on a second. Yeah. Lift it up slowly, lift it up a little bit more. Okay, angle it this way. Okay, a little bit up. Oh, there, there it is. Like you, you know, said, it just uh, takes time for things to get in the same sequence that you need it to. Yeah. Well, it, but that ties right into what you were saying the other day, too. Takes it a little bit to charge up. Yep. Takes it a long time also to dissipate. Yes. Absolutely, it'll set there, up there there, there's a, or it dissipates. the the capacitor of the earth and everything on it. You know, it's um, that's it's incredible. You know, right? And nothing happens instantly, but nothing goes away instantly either. Which tie that into your idea of time. You know, if energy is, takes a while to build, are you really there when you're there? If it takes a long time to go away, are you really gone when you're when you're gone? You know. It's it becomes very fascinating. It really blurs the lines and makes you think. Well, it, it also it blows your mind on structure. Okay. If you ever see these scientists, they create this thing in the center, it looks like this, like an apple that's been eaten. Then they create the one on the outside and they try to put the energy in the center, right? In between the two. So they're inside the donut, is what they're doing, is they're creating energy. But the energy isn't there. It's in the hole of the donut. It's in the hole. And, and, they don't, and they're building it all wrong. They're, they're trying to hold something on the outside where naturally it doesn't want to be. They're trying to hold it in the donut where it doesn't want to be. That That's just a means to the end. The end is in the hole of the donut. And right. They're building it wrong, and they're wondering why they're having troubles capturing the energy. Because they just aren't building it right. Because, I, I, I mean, it's an opinion, but, I mean, it's because of subtlety. It's because of expectation. You see, yeah. like, um, you have this guy building those um, plasma thrusters. Very cool channel that that guy's got. I forget his name. Plasma. I think it might even be called the Plasma Channel. channel yeah. Right? So he's building these thrusters. And I get a kick out of him, you know, but, like, I notice he's discharging plasma left and right. How are you going to... He's if, using if the energy. He, right, just keep on strapping one over the other and experiment with different shapes. And I get that it's not easy to just have a plasma field and be satisfied, <laughs> you 
<laughs> that you have to see something in order to think it's working. You know, sometimes it's just working. What I've never seen that guy do is act forces against it. It's just a stationary thing with like, oh, look, it's blowing wind. You know, cool. You created this field. Stop trying to discharge the thing. Just try to make it do what it's doing. And then take things like a, like a magnetic field. Take things like, you know, objects. Start throwing it through the thing and see what happens. You ever see him do that? I've never seen him throw anything through the center of that. I'd love to. <laughs> you know, might be especially like, a, you know, just placing it on its end and dropping a piece of aluminum through it. Well, that's the thing. As soon as he creates the ion, he's used the energy because it got hot. Yeah. As soon as he did it, he, he ended the process. So, and that's what the whole thing is when you look at all these plasma things. Because I build them. I, I build plasma all the time. I could do plasma displays all day. They use the energy. And, and when you're doing the coil, you don't want to use the energy right away. You want to steal off it and siphon from it. But you never want to use it directly. That's the point. In, in every right. plasma thing that you do, it's using everything. It, it, it's changing the form of it, adding heat, and then it expels energy out of it. But that's, but that's where entropy comes in is that the objective measure is the is is the entropy that's created when the heat is generated when the light from the plasma is discharged you know that's what becomes objective he was running um tests and it's like oh voltage I, but i don't see the effect the effect that he was trying to achieve which was you know, throw. but my point is, is are you measuring that properly? My answer, uh, I don't think it, it's being measured properly. I think that by, you know, looking for the field in other ways is probably, and then understanding how to manipulate that is the question. You know, uh, it's, it's always asking the wrong questions. Is, yeah. Is, I don't think it's a matter of his intelligence or anything. No, like that. no, not at all. He's very capable. It's a matter of how he shows it. He's trying to display something you don't see. You know what I mean? So when he does the vortex, and you can see the vortex, he's displaying it. When you see the plasma blow off, he's displaying it. When you see it go down into the fog, and it makes the thing, he's displaying it. I think Which was awesome, by the way. That, that was incredible. That was amazing. But I think he's just trying to show how to see it. I don't think he's trying to use it. I think he just wants to show how to see it. I don't I, think you're wrong about that because it's it, again, it all ties back. Yeah, I think people, he knows people don't exactly resonate with the, I, the these concepts when it's not able to be objectively observed in 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 a way that they could experience. You know, so yeah, I mean, props to him for breaking that code. You know, yeah. If I could sit there and show you in a fog machine what the energy fields were, it just blow your mind. Yeah. But I don't know how to do that, and I can't seem to figure it out. Every time I try something from his channel to do that, I can't because um, I don't want to use the energy. I, look again. I've said it a thousand times, and this will make a thousand and one. I don't. I don't know anything. It's just what comes to mind. But you know, when you're trying to test, um, do that at home test for radiation and such you know, super chilled alcohol vapor. I think that that's the way to uh, visualize it, at, you know, super in a very reasonable. Chilled. Not dry ice, you're saying super chilled alcohol. Um, well, it, it, is rubbing alcohol or what is it? I'd have to Google it to remember off the top of my head. I'm pulling, again, I'm, I'm pulling my ideas out of the ether, <laughs> you know, as, as we talk. Yeah, I get um, it. You know, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a plate, like a, a plate base with alcohol. Um, an acrylic uh, tub on top to kind of just close the system, you know, and then they super chill it. Now, whether there's definitely dry ice involved, but I don't know that it's dry. I don't know that it's dry ice inside the chamber. It might just be like beneath the tray that's super chilling the alcohol. Okay. So um, when it's not visible vapor, unless if something, a cosmic ray, for instance, hits. You know, because the cosmic ray sine wave, you know, would go right through 
unobstructed right through the container. But when it hits this um, uh, environment of, of the super chilled alcohol vapor, it, it's like right on the point of vaporization where any disturbance will tip the scale. So you actually see the streak. You actually see the, feel, you know, any disturbance that's brought into it. Okay, I'm gonna have to look that up. super chilled alcohol. I'm gonna have to look that up. Yeah, it's like a radio, radio uh, activity test. You know, you can see environmental um, cosmic rays and radiation with it. I mean, it, even if you don't have a radioactive source, hmm. you know, you could still just put it outside and just by virtue of you know it being outside, it just All right. you got me on that one. I'm gonna check that out because I yeah. want to visualize the field that I know is there. That that's my it. biggest problem, by the way. That's my biggest problem is when things become so many things, understanding how they're interacting with one another in a visual sense to be able to know off the cuff, here's what's got to happen in order for this to be the way we need it. That's where it's there, but it, it becomes arduous, yeah. you know. Because when you have to work too hard for it instead of just seeing it, it, it makes it difficult to understand. It does. I, I've noticed that. Like, I could go on for days on how this thing works. You know what I mean? But it doesn't mean everybody's following me, and they're not following in the same path that I'm going in. I, I know that. Like, if I told you the yin and the yang sign, right? They're two little balls, and they're spiraling, and they make that same little symbol, right? Which is everything, by the way. If I just told you that they're a 2D image of a 3D image and what it's supposed to be, right? If I just told you that swirl doesn't happen on this level, but it happened on this level. So now instead of swirling in the center like this, now they're swirling on the outside of the donut. If you can visualize the change, then it starts to make sense. So a lot of these things, you can only write them in 2D. But in order to put it in your mind right, you have to go to third and fourth dimension to see it. Well, it's, you know, you could take your measures, you could do your test, you could gauge where things are and how they're interacting at certain points. But the more points you have, the better um, information, you know, um, as to what it actually is, is available. You know, and um, visualizing it would definitely bring that full circle because then there's no question you're not guessing where this ends where this starts and where this interacts you can see it um but again to, you know do i know no i don't know but in my imagination you know then taking this two or even 3d i mean you know you could use a a ferro fluid or something like that to potentially to, to visualize some of these things whatever but that's what we're observing here, but we, you know, I still believe that it's it's that one step above, at least, if not more. Oh, so I, now I you have to agree. now you have to say, okay, this is what we're observing in the here. So now, what aren't we seeing that's still a part of this? You know, probably right. just replicated around itself a couple more times. You know, um. Yeah, it's uh, it's crazy. I mean, think about time. I mean, think about uh, objects in space. You know, your little rock, and in three D, well, the rocks all that exist in the sea of nothing. This whole fourth dimension. Now, this rock is somewhere amongst other things that's somewhere with it. And you know, you have um, oh, shit. Yeah. I've, I've tapped into so many places in my mind in these kind of in this conversation that like accessing the other parts are. Uh, a tetrahedron is that what it is uh a cube within a cube four dimensional uh, no I it's so. hold on I forget i forget off the top of my head that's not a tetrahedron is it i'm usually pretty good with geometry stuff but it's like like i said i'm getting a little <laughs> look it up No, no, tetrahedron's uh, 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 the pyramid version. Um, anyway, uh, there's the cube within the cube. If somebody in the chat wants to help out, what's a 4D cube called? I'm going to... It's not the Makama. Uh, a tesseract, thank you. Tesseract. You know, like a tesseract. Okay, 
So there's 4D space, our reality being a tesseract, right? Now we know, I put that into context of um, its movement, you know? Um, same as a torus, right? You know, the torus is in on, it's both in and out, and it's, you know, coming in onto itself. Now, if, if you see the animation of a tesseract um, through the act of time, you know, it's continuously coming out and into itself, becoming itself as, and that is the movement of time, by the way. Like, that is the movement of time. And everything is happening within that, right? That's so, oh my God, it just it just hit me why they called it that in that movie, in, in, a, in a Marvel movie. Why it's they call it what? Why they call it a Tesseract. Oh, it, right. It's, it's the doorway between both, and now it makes sense. So, right. So you have the inside coming out and the inside coming in in a fluid motion. And that is the Tesseract movement that is time with all these things existing within it, right? So, um, it's, first of all, it's my opinion that something has to be acting upon that. Think about a conveyor belt, you know? If, in this case, like a Tesseract would be like a cylinder in the conveyor belt. The conveyor belt is you know moving in this case not the not the cylinder you know the conveyor belt is moving and it's spinning the cylinder you know now if you take that analogy and you bring that into a fourth dimensional space with the tesseract you have the tesseract coming in and out but you have something moving atop that yes. which is causing the which is the mechanism for which that time is occurring so yeah. in the reason I bring this up is because when doing these visualization tests, you need to bring it outside of what's observed here, scale it up to fourth dimensional space, and then look outside of that. You have to yeah. look outside of that. That's where your measures must come from. I don't know if it's one step outside of that or two steps. Out. I don't know how many steps. But the answer is not. It's here, but it's what's working on us. That's why these things come in and out of existence. That's why these things um, are a potential until they're not. It's yeah. because they are somewhere, always. <laughs> you know, it's just simply not always here where it could be measured, visualized, thought of in that thing. So when, when you're thinking about uh, defeating time space, which again, is probably a requirement of gra gravitational time dilation, manipulation. That's the level that you need to think on. That's where the measures need to be, is not here or the idea of there. It's just one step beyond that, whatever that mechanism is. And that's where, this, that's where these fields are actually working on. So when observed, Again, I'm not a mathematician. I'm, I'm, if anything, I'm, I'm a hobbyist philosopher. But probably, you, you know, it's it's really knowing what um these energies that we're working with, you know, are doing just outside of our scope of reason. Hmm. You know, that's the and that's how uh, one once you. Because sometimes, you know, you could create something within the understanding that we have of it. You know, think and not understand it fully, you know. I have that. Sometimes, like some parts of the day, clear as day. Yeah. Next part of the day, I'm just, just outside of it, right? Mm -hmm. And then some days I'm so way beyond it, it's unreal. You know what I mean? It's just... Yeah. Something's going on where I'm not connecting every dot every second. Yeah. It's like uh, when, when the pharmaceutical companies come out with a new medicine, they're like, well, it works in clinical trials, but we don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, well, you found it and it works and it's great. And hey, look at this, but you don't even know what it's doing. That's a lot of science right now. They're, they're explaining the known and they don't discover the unknown to find out that they known is it right see i'm not a control freak but when it comes to things like we're discussing having understanding and control over it is the paramount key you know because um 
Yeah, it's like okay, you got it to float, but now what? You, now what? Now, now you got to steer it about. Now you got to go faster. You know, now you got to go faster by what? Manipulating time. Well, how do I do that? Oh, wait, we already did that, but we Check. don't know why. Check it out. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just going to say this. We are about to leap into a huge thing within a few months. Like, it's not just going to take one step. It's going to take all of them at once. And it, it, it's because of the collaboration of the people that we brought in that's doing it. By far, it's not me, okay? I, I'm like directing traffic in this whole thing, even though I know specialty parts of it. You know what I mean? It, yeah. It, it's a whole community thing, and it just takes off like crazy. That's and it. That's the way it's got to work, and you never once want to take credit for it yourself. It's everybody bringing it in. Yeah, no. It's It's been a um, very ancient collaborative effort. Yes. You know? Always is very ancient collaborative effort of, you know, I'd like to, and you know, what's funny about the people that I find are most genuine in their uh, approach to these things. Cause me, I'm be honest with you. I mean, I don't know if you got the vibe. I'm, I'm just as fascinated, if not more so fascinated with the idea of all this than I am actually doing any of it. You know, <laughs> you're, you're doing, I, I have great admiration for that. That's amazing to me. You know, I, I like the idea of the understanding of it more. And that brings me into other spaces. You know, um, uh, you look at like Malcolm Bendel, you know, um, I'm not saying he won't make a buck off of whatever he's doing eventually or whatever have you, but he's also not trying to keep it a secret. You know, yeah. I, I don't think he could, you know, but he, the, the truth is, you know, most of the people that are in this, they're just in it to make that progress. It's not about their name being attached to it. It's not about who's using it and who's not. It's not about, you know, taking power away from this person, that person and money out of their pocket and blah, blah. Nobody gives a shit about any of that that's serious. And this, as far as I know, and even Tesla himself, he was the epitome of that. The man was literally he, he was begging for funds to complete stuff that he had like already in, in process and didn't care if a single dollar of it was left for himself and honestly if it meant not eating for a couple of days because he had to do whatever it was to you know means to the end that those are the people that i'm seeing those are the people. Nobody's trying to get rich. I mean, I'm not saying nobody. Somebody's always trying to get rich doing something. You know, you know, I see this build it, show it, tell it. You know what I mean? The richness comes in the friends that you make. That's, yeah. where it comes. That's all that's going to matter when you're at the end. And yeah. in the journey. In the journey, you know? Like, yeah. That's what I mean. The friends. The people you meet, the people you talk to. That's it. Yeah, that, That's all the... the reward i need you know what i mean and i don't care if my name's ever said in any of it, it that's it be, be humble be real you know it's it, it's the way and you know full on if i'm gonna end on any note i would say look i really don't think i know much or anything you know, and, and i mean that in no definitive sense because what anything that i've said that i that i believed or experienced today could easily be very changed and altered by any one given experience down the road you know um it, there's only so much that a curious human mind can conjure you know with the information available yeah. um you know and um sometimes being able to um identify and articulate these experiences that we all have you know um is just the best anyone can do you know um so Nothing I've said in this is matter of fact, <laughs> you know, I, I want to put that out there and um, for no other reason than my own pure curiosity and, um, you know, just to meet new people. And if I could enrich um, or spark that, hey, wait, I, I kind of know what that guy's saying. This one time in my own life, I, this one thing, now I understand it. Now that's a piece in your own toolbox. Even if it's totally opposite of what I said, I just, uh, you know, your own truth. Even if it's totally opposite, if, if I spark some thought in your head, 
then this has been awesome. That's my contribution, you know, is uh, that's the value of disagreement. And people don't understand too, is even yeah. if you're like, there's a bunch of hooey horse shit. Well, why do you think it's hooey horse shit? Yeah. Now you're thinking about it. I got you thinking, well, you fine. know, and that's, that's it. I completely so. agree. Hey, you know what? It's been a totally awesome time today, man, with this whole conversation. I really do appreciate it, Joe. Thank no, you. no, I appreciate you. Like, trust me, you, you, you were, um, you were my famous head, my friend. So, oh, well, um, you. <laughs> you know, I don't have any YouTube videos. I don't talk to people about this stuff. This is, you know, this is my pleasure. Oh, right on. Thank you. You know what? We'll have to do it again because I, I know with Gerald in the room and Ben in the room. It'll just light it up, man. So this is be totally awesome. Anytime you want to have me, I'm more than happy. I am. Uh, I live in a basement these days. It's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a little personal note for anybody. Not that anybody cares. So I was I was literally a millionaire four years ago. Really. And um, you know, the, I got into a hard time with my my uh, ex wife, and you know what? There came a point in time where I just literally went like this. What it's is it? It's not mean? that important anymore. The money's just not. It's it'll it'll kill you. Fighting for stuff, material stuff especially, it'll kill you in ways, you know, that sometimes just aren't worth it. You know, so I have a lot of time. I guess that's where, and I have no tools anymore. <laughs> I used to have a really great workshop, you know. Like, <laughs> I used to have an awesome workshop and, and you know, ability to like if I had these ideas, I'd just be like, you know what I'm about to do? I'm about to dump dump some, you know, time and money into it. Now I'm just like, you know what? The ideas have brought me more satisfaction than any level of actually doing. So for anybody out there that thinks like, you know, hey, I don't have the ability you know, to do all this stuff that these people are doing, you know, just know that uh, doing it's half of it, you know, and figuring it out and making it better or making it like make more sense. That's just as important as the rest, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, man. Right on. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank yes, you sir. everybody for tuning in, man. Absolutely amazing talk. Yes. Thank you, Nathan. I look forward to the next one. Right on. Have a good night. See you later, guys. Take care, everybody.